Okay, we are lucky today to be joined by Olitsa Vlacic, Consulate General of the Republic of Serbia in New York. She has been kind enough to come and help us introduce our conference today, as our dear friend Nikola Lonchar has been unable to attend due to a loss in his family. We would like to dedicate this conference today to Milan Lonchar, who unfortunately tragically lost his life earlier this week in Philadelphia due to gun violence. We would like us to keep the Lonchar family in our hearts and in our um, prayers as we go through the work of sharing about Tesla today. Olitsa, thank you so much for being with us. I turn it over to you. Alita, can you come off mute? I'm sorry. Alita, can you come off mute to introduce us? We can't hear you yet. Still can't. Let's see. Maybe I can unmute you. Ashley, I think she has to unmute herself in the left yeah. hand corner. There she is. Okay. Hi, Alita. Hi, Ashley. Hi, everyone. Hello. I'd like to welcome everybody to this year's uh, Tesla's Memorial Conference and Spirits Award. First time we go virtual. Uh, I was given the honor of addressing you at the last minute and by very sad circumstances. As you have he heard, a uh, family of Nicola Launcher has suffered terrible tragedy this past week. So as much as he wanted to be here with us today, he felt like he needed to be with his family during these times of sorrow. So he asked me to take his place and join Ashley in opening this conference. Indeed, I feel like a poor substitute for a man whose passion and uh, determination and love for Nikola Tesla has been a driving force behind Tesla Science Foundation and this event. Consular General of the Republic of Serbia in New York had pleasure of working with Mr. Uh, Mr. Lonchev and Tesla Science Foundation and supporting Tesla Conference from the very beginning. Personally, this is the fourth time that I'm here with you. And as many as, of, uh, as many of you, I feel that so much has changed since we met for, met for the last time in January 2020. The COVID-19 pandemic has turned our, our world and our lives upside down and put so much in jeopardy. But despite all it all, thanks to hard work and perseverance of men and women of Tesla Science Foundation in Philadelphia, we are here today, despite everything, and determined to keep Tesla's flame uh, still burning. Every year, this conference provides an opportunity to connect and reconnect, to learn, to reflect, to, to take score of what was done and what can be done, and to get inspired to do more in promoting Tesla and his legacy. I feel that in 2020, Tesla's work became more relevant than ever, as we got to rely on technology in every aspect of our daily lives. Technology heavily founded on the research and inventions of Nikola Tesla. We are still far away, of course, from a level of recognition that Tesla deserves. But I feel a bit optimistic as I see the world taking baby steps in uh, learning more about Tesla. He's more present in popular culture. We see him more on TV, in motion pictures. And personally, I was very happy to see an episode of Brainchild on Netflix that was dealing with Tesla Coil. I'm happy because every little bit helps to spark curiosity about great scientists and his work. Uh, we have some good news from Serbia, even if the, in this year that wasn't so good for anybody, I guess. Uh, on December 24, our government adopted a decision to move Nikola Tesla Museum in Belgrade to its new location that would allow for the rich collection of the museum that holds thousands of Tesla's documents, books, photographs, his personal items that were previously just stored in depots of the museum because there was no enough space for them to be displayed. Now they're gonna be on permanent display. And uh, very appropriately, 
Nicola Industrial Museum will find its new home in a building that was one house, once housing Belgrade's first power plant called Power and Light. New museum will have more than 300,000 uh, square feet of space and will also include library and a science campus. So once this pandemic is over, I invite everyone to come to Belgrade and visit new Tesla Museum. As we celebrate in 2021, 140 years of diplomatic relations between Serbia and the United States, we also pay tribute to many great Serb Americans who served as the strongest links between two nations. Among them, Tesla's name shines brightest. So thank you very much for this opportunity to speak to you. I wouldn't want, I don't, wouldn't want to take more of your, of your time because I know we have a long and great lineup of speakers whose presentations we're going to enjoy. So once again, I would like to thank you for being here today and I wish you to stay healthy and safe so we could again meet in person next year in New Yorker Hotel. Thank you. Thank you so much for coming and that lovely introduction. I knew Nicola would be proud to have you uh, take his place and honor us today. Um, Craig, there are some people in the waiting room. If you can either make me the co-host or let them in. And we're gonna introduce our first speaker, someone I've really enjoyed working with at the Franklin Institute where he volunteers and has worked. Um, thank you, I'm co-host, adding some more people in. Um, Robert Swain. Director of Engineering for Tesla Science Foundation. Kind enough to come here. He is a great educator. He does wonderful demonstrations of equipment that are engaging for students and adults alike. Um, the vision for this Zoom format is that videos and presentations like Robert is gonna give today will be able to then be used in Tesla clubs, both in the United States and Serbia and all around the globe. So um, Craig, I don't know if we are ready for the video yet. Robert, would you like to speak to the group? Bob, can you get closer to your mic? Turn your mic up. Go. How about now? Yes, now we can hear you. Great. Okay. Good to see you, Bob. Good to see y'all. Are we, um, do we have a time frame? I want to keep my so, phone charged up. So, Mr. Swan, I can play your video now if you'd like. Would you like me to play that first? Would you like me to play your video first? Yes or no? Or do you want to do your speech? We still can't hear you, Bob. No, Craig, go, go ahead and play the video, Craig, because we can't hear him. Let's play Bob's video, okay? Thank you. Hi, I'm Bob Swain, Director of Engineering for the Tesla Science Foundation. Today we're going to talk about Nikola Tesla and the induction motor. Back in Tesla's days, all motors were DC, direct current. They had commutators, carbon brushes, and required high maintenance. When Tesla saw the DC motor in operation in one of his classes at Graz University of Technology, he knew he could come up with a better method. Walking in a Budapest park one day, he had an epiphany, a revelation of a rotating magnet.
had DC current and also alternating current, but just single phase, what you see here. Yeah, but here's what Tesla came up with. So take a look at this second slide, which shows a two-phase sine wave. What Tesla did to come up, his concept, was to add this second sine wave approximately 90 degrees apart. So sine wave one comes first, and a fraction of a second later, electrically 90 degrees later, comes the second sine wave. And we'll see how this creates a rotating magnetic field. I'm here at the Tesla Science Foundation, and here is a reproduction of an egg of Columbus, which Tesla used at the 1893 World's Fair to demonstrate his invention of the rotating magnetic field. So here is a solid copper egg. The electromagnetic coils are below, and here's the power supply that takes 120 volts from the wall outlet and converts it to two phase, two sine waves going into these coils below. So let's turn it on and watch it rotate and stand on its end. It may show as a jerky action because of the digital delay. Here we go. The egg is spinning by the rotating magnetic field and the egg is now standing, spinning on its end. So let's look at a do-it-yourself, a DIY version of Tesla's Egg of Columbus. Here we have four coils and we wire them. Sine wave one goes to these two and sine wave two goes to these two. And when sine wave one peaks, this peaks positive, this peaks negative, and a short time later, these two peak, this one positive, this one negative. And that happens time. This comes first, this goes, this goes, this goes, this goes. It goes in circles, and that's the rotating magnetic field. So let's see it operate. I have here a doorbell transformer, 16 volts, plugged into a wall outlet. And then uh, the secondary 16 volts comes into a push button. And those wires come to this connection right here, wired to these set of coils and these set of coils. But these set of coils here, sine wave two, is wired through a capacitor. And that is what gives it that 90 degree separation. So let's try it. I'm going to put this metal egg right in the middle. And you, it will spin, but because of the digital delay, you're, you'll probably just see it jerking uh, as, it try, as it spins, but you will see it finally stand up. So I'm gonna push the button to apply the two-phase power to these four coils, and here we go. I've pushed the button, the egg is spinning, and you'll see it rise right there. And this is what Tesla demonstrated at the 1893 World's Fair in Chicago and showed his magnetic field through induction. And of course, there are induction motors all around on the table as well. Thanks for watching this video on Tesla's conception of the rotating magnetic field and his invention of the induction motor. If you have any questions or comments, or want to know how to build your own Egg of Columbus, contact me through the Tesla Science Foundation. Have a good day. That was wonderful, Robert. I'm sorry your microphone's not working. If it gets working, we hope to hear you at some point, okay? Thank you. Next up, we are very happy to welcome Mr. Ellis Oswalt, the author of Tesla's Words. Welcome, Ellis. Hey, thank you, Ashley. Uh, thanks for that video, Bob. Lovely demonstration. 
Um, so I'm here to talk to you about two projects I've been working on uh, in conjunction with the Tesla Science Foundation uh, for our Tesla clubs that we're introducing uh, into schools, working with schools uh, to get these educational materials and insert Nikola Tesla into the education. Um, the first project I'm going to talk to you about is my new book, Tesla's Words, The Stunning Utopia of the Future. Um, so this is... Um, this is an adaptation of Tesla's original 1919 autobiography written 101 years ago. Uh, I happen to, my personal opinion is that the, uh, the Tesla autobiography is the strangest, weirdest thing in the entire canon of the English language literature. Uh, it's wild, it shouldn't exist, and yet it does. Um, right away, Tesla starts talking to you directly. It's straight from the horse's mouth. He's telling you about all these crazy hallucinations that he has suffered from his entire life. And uh, he starts talking about technology that he's been dreaming up of since the 1890s that exists now, but typically we don't think of it is, is existing in the, in the 1800s. Um, and so it's like this science fiction, fantasy, hallucination, technology, story that is really wild, but the problem is it's really hard to read. Uh, it was written 100 years ago, which is really not that long ago. Um, Shakespeare, I compare it to Shakespeare a lot. Shakespeare was um, over 400 years ago in comparison, uh, much more difficult to read. Uh, uh, but I also like to compare it to Mary Shelley's Frankenstein to give you an idea of how difficult it is to read. Mary Shelley's Frankenstein was written 100 years prior to Nikola Tesla's autobiography. And despite Mary Shelley's Frankenstein being 100 years older, much, much easier to read. Most of our high schools have this in the, uh, in the curriculum. Ninth graders are reading Frankenstein without uh, any problem. But for some reason, Tesla's autobiography has all this information in it. And it's just not what you would call light reading. You have to reread everything three times to kind of get the message. Right. So I knew I had to bring attention to how beautiful and how crazy this autobiography was. So I needed to do something dramatic, something radical and repackage it for the 21st century, 21st century and dramatically simplify the language so that it's easy, enjoyable, colorful, fun to give what it actually is so that we can just bring it to life. And so. I've done this. Um, in the introduction, I tell my audience right away, hey, go find the original. It's free online. Uh, you know, don't take it from me. Take it from Nikola Tesla himself. It's free online. Go find it. And then I introduce uh, this concept, and I'll be telling you that the whole book is Nikola Tesla reading to you, speaking to you directly, telling you the story of his life. He's kind of spilling his beans and telling you all his secrets. And I introduce this um, this this method of these bold quotes throughout the experience. So Nikola Tesla is speaking to you the whole time. And every time you see bold lettering, this is a direct quote of Nikola Tesla's. And that way it's just a constant reminder that this is Nikola Tesla's message. And it's a great fun way to uh, preserve the original as well. Okay, so here's a quick introduction of the whole book. It's six chapters. The original autobiography is six chapters. Right away in chapter one, he starts telling you about these, these really insane hallucinations, these powerful hallucinations that he's experiencing in his, his whole life. And he's telling you, um, like, for example, if he's listening, if he's eavesdropping to a conversation, whatever those people are talking about in a conversation, if they're talking about birds, he's going to automatically hallucinate birds just flying around. Uh, whatever he's thinking about, whatever is crossing his mind, he is hallucinating. And he's telling us it's very consistent, very frequent. And what's even weirder is he tells us that this um, condition is what set him up for success in life. And he really attributes all his success as an inventor and a scientist to this condition that he suffered from. The rest of the book is strictly about technology and how he came up with the technology and what it has done and where it's going. So chapter two and three lead into uh, how he came up with the alternating current induction motor, which as we all know is the foundation of our society. Uh, chapter four, 
He tells us how he came up with the Tesla coil and its uses. Chapter five, he tells us about his vision for a wireless world system of communication. I can't, I don't have time to talk about that. Most of us here probably know about it, but it's very exciting and thrilling that someone envisioned an internet long before computers even existed. And chapter six is very thrilling. Chapter six, Nikola Tesla tells us that the existing inventions that he has created are going to continue to evolve after he is gone and turn into artificial intelligence. Uh, he tells us that he believes, quote, uh, machines will be possessed of reason, end quote. Uh, it's very creepy, very thrilling. And uh, he also tells us a, a fun story about how he tried to sell the Ford Motor Company uh, on the idea of self-driving cars, and they just weren't ready for it in, uh, in those 100 years ago when this was happening. So that's out now. You can buy it on uh, Amazon, Barnes & Noble. The audiobook is next week. Um, uh, you know, uh, anyone who wants this book and can afford the 12 bucks, email me, I'll send you the PDF. I want everyone in the world to read this. Uh, follow me on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at Tesla's Words. Okay, so that's one of the things I've been working on for the Tesla Sounds Foundation. Uh, actually, that was independently, but we came together on it. Um, another thing, I am co-authoring a play for the Tesla Science Foundation uh, with uh, Gordana Pavlovic and uh, Mr. Nikola Longtar himself. Uh, they've written a great plot and I'm just helping them uh, rewrite some dialogue. And it's a great story. It's kind of like um, um, A Night at the Museum with Ben Stiller, uh, or maybe a little bit like Magic School Bus, the 1990s cartoon show. Um, and it's part of, um, this package of materials we're giving schools for their Tesla clubs, okay? Uh, so this is the story of a classroom where uh, one of the students becomes aware of Nikola Tesla and brings it to the teacher's attention. The teacher's a little zany and she takes it upon herself and she realizes, okay, well, we're not learning about this in the textbooks. So she drops her, her, she drops what she's doing. She drops her coursework for the day and she takes the class to the Tesla Science Foundation Tesla Museum to learn about Nikola Tesla since it's not being taught in the textbooks. And what happens when they reach the museum is that the museum comes to life. And in a sort of a way, we, we meet Nikola Tesla himself in the flesh in the form of a hologram. Um, and Nikola Tesla tells you the story of his life. It, not so much in the same in the book that I just told you about. He really tells you a lot of personal details about his life. So in this play, it's, it's more strictly a technology education. Uh, but it's really exciting. This museum is coming to life. Nikola Tesla himself is still alive there speaking to us. And there are other scenes that come to life in the form of holograms. And what's really fun is as soon as possible, the, the Tesla Science Foundation is trying to film this to give it to the schools so they can have it as a resource and put it in projectors so that the actors, uh, the, the children, the actors who are performing this play can play alongside the film projection, uh, which will, will be the hologram in the story the Nikola Tesla hologram and the other holograms, okay? Um, let's see. Uh, and it doesn't necessarily have to be performed and produced by schools. They can also use it as a um, just a group activity, reading aloud, assigning each child a particular character as uh, the teacher leads them in this group activity of reading it out loud. Although we do want to encourage the, the, the schools to put it on if they can. And we wanna do it and um, give them all the resources and all the attention we can. We want it to be cost efficient. If schools have a zero dollar budget, we want them to be able to produce the play. And so um, it's not just the book and the play. Um, the play, the script for the play is gonna be finished really soon. The, the book is finished now, uh, but it's not just these two materials that we're giving the Tesla clubs. We're also giving them uh, additional study materials to go along with the book and the play. Study questions, discuss, discussion questions. We wanna do everything to facilitate the learning that we can to make it as easy as possible for our teachers 
to get this to the children, to get the children excited, to get the kids, the students, young adults excited and about learning about Nikola Tesla. Um, and uh, yeah, again, uh, check out teslaswords.com, follow Tesla's Words on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. I'll be very active. Um, audiobooks next week. And uh, I guess you'll probably be hearing another speaker talk about the Tesla clubs a little bit more. So thank you guys so much. Uh, excited to get to know you all and be here with you today. And I think that wraps it up for me. Thank you all so much. Thank you, Alice. We really appreciate your work. Um, as you've been listening here, you can tell that now we have, um, when people are asking, well, where's the stuff for Tesla Club? This is it. You, me, everyone here, we are the stuff for Tesla Club. So um, Ellis's book, the play, Bob's recording, and all the materials we're going to present here today will be available um, for any of the Tesla Clubs who want to use them as we work through the next year. Next up, we have our Director of Science for the Tesla Science Foundation, Harry Ohm, and he is going to talk to us about wireless energy transfer. Uh, how are you doing, Harry? Okay, mm -hmm. should I share my screen or? Okay, let's see, Craig, see. Craig, are you ready for him? Hey, hey, hey Harry, yep. Okay, um, you? I'll be, I'll, I'll be... Do, you, or, or, do you share it or I share it? If you would like to share your screen, Harry, you're more than welcome to do so. Okay. That's fine. Thank you. All right. Hi. Uh, many of our audience here are aware that in the late 19th century, Nikola Tesla first pioneered the work of wireless power transfer and its applications. Maybe you have seen pictures of the Warncliffe Tower, or maybe you have seen photos of Tesla holding an illuminated light bulb in his hand without any wire attached. Today, more than 130 years later, we are living in a wireless world full of wonderful electronic gadgets. I'm sure we are all familiar with Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, television, radio, and mobile communications. But when it comes to power, the transmission of electrical power is almost exclusively still provided using wires. To most people, the notion of wireless transfer of electric power would seem remote, impossible, and even fictional. Stop for a moment and imagine. A future where electricity can be supplied without any battery or wires. Yes, without batteries. In this presentation, we will see that this future is not a dream. It is not science fiction. In fact, we are talking about the near future, possibly a society revolutionized by wireless power transfer technology. First, do you know what wireless power transfer technology is around us today? Here I name a few. Yes, uh, the first one say mobile charging pad is one that, that we are familiar to charge the mobile phone with a wire. Another example that you may not be aware, it's an electric toothbrush. How about a counter, countertop induction cooker and a electrical kettle? The way that these devices work is through induction coupling. A transmitter is connected to a power source and through an induction coil, generate an electric field. When a receiver coil is put within the range of the transmitter, it receives the energy in the form of electric current or voltage. The energy transfer efficiency is greatly increased if the transmitter and receiver coil have the same resonance frequency. The main objective is to offer greater mobility, safety, and convenience, even without a battery. If a, battery, if a storage battery is available, in the receiver, the technique can be used to recharge the battery. Induction energy coupling can occur either by magnetic field or electric field in the radio frequency range. Typically, magnetic coupling is for a shorter distance and electric field coupling can be uh, achieved further range. Recently, 
This new research constructed and tested a wireless charging demo room using magnetic coupling technology. The wall, ceiling, and floor of the room are made of aluminum and connected to a copper pipe placed in the center of the room. When a transmitter circuit outside of the room is turned on, current flows around the room, creating magnetic field inside the room. The magnetic field is turn, uh, in turn is capable of powering up, at the same time, multiple electronics device and charging wirelessly. And um, in biomedic application, wireless power transfer can be used to recharge a pacemaker battery wirelessly, thus avoiding the needed surgery to, of today to replace an outdated battery. Wireless power transfer can also be used to wirelessly energize an implanted device to record important neural activity data from epilepsy patients and the power, the potential and advantages of wireless power transfer in biomedical application is increasing. And we can even use muscles energy to cell power a pacemaker in the future. Another application of a wireless transfer is for charging electrical vehicle wirelessly in the home garage and public parking. Like mobile phone wireless charging, the driver just need to leave the vehicle parked above, above the charging pad. The advantage of wireless power transfer is that one does not have to worry about forgetting to plug in the vehicle overnight and find a weak battery the next morning. And taking it to the next level, induction coils can be placed underneath the road to continuously transfer energy to the receiver in the vehicle while the vehicle is driving. So we have a charging lane. This is dy dynamic wireless charging and could become an even more flexible approach to power transfer, allowing vehicles to pick up charge on the go. Such an innovation technology approach which is feasible on almost any type of road and under any sorts of environment condition and environmental condition could remove the need for traditional charging infrastructure, such as gas station. It could also act as an elegant yet robust approach to the powering of electrical municipal and public transport vehicles, such as buses that operate on the same road week in and week out. If all these seems too good to be true, the technology of solar power satellite is gonna blow your mind. Space-based solar power station satellites are large structure in space, like an array of solar panel that converts solar energy into a form of energy that can be transmitted wirelessly, wirelessly back to the earth or any other remote receiving station. The technology has been proven to work by NASA and some other space organization in the last 30 years, with microwave being the preferred option to beam the energy back to Earth. Today, it is just a matter of bringing the cost down to be economically attractive. And you may ask, is microwave safe? It all depends on the intensity and energy density. With low energy density, the received microwave antenna will occupy a very large area, kilo, kilometers wide, and no harm is done to, to life. However, we call it a microwave oven, which is a useful household device for cooking. Most people do not even realize that microwave oven is a wireless power transfer invention. In this case, high power energy is confined inside the oven to cook the food in a wireless fashion. If the energy were to leak outside the room, that would be dangerous. However, in military application, the damaging effects of focused microwave energy is precisely the objective. In this case, it is called microwave directed energy weapon. It is quite possible that the death ray machine Tesla described to end war 
may actually have been a directed energy weapon. The most important question on solar power satellite is who governed the space? Not even, not every country can afford its own solar power satellites. Some countries will have to purchase the energy distribution from other providing countries. Then how do we handle these debating questions? Are we going to have a third world war in space? These questions must be answered as the technology, te technological possibility become a reality. Tomorrow, when we come out of the pandemic, the world will have been dramatically changed. We are seeing more work from home, online classes, everything internet, everything online, smart this, smart that, contact tracing, facial recognition, data mining, big data, um, drone applications, internet of things, artificial intelligence, RFID. How will these emerging technology trend emerge? Right now, we are all witnessing that the world's geopolitical environment is changing rap re rapidly as the pandemic slowly plays out. There seems to be many different forces trying to reset and reshape our future world economy. Like in a movie, it is too early to tell who is the good guy and who is the bad guy, who is right and who is wrong. In conclusion, I hope we can see that wireless transfer, like a sharp knife and other technology as well, can be used to benefit the society, but can also be used to destroy our civilization. How do we exercise our responsibility to push these technology in the right direction for good use? That will be all my presentation. Thank you. We really appreciate you coming today and I hope someday soon we will be back at Franklin Institute doing educator nights together. We really miss seeing you in person. Um, I'm happy I got some guidance from my friend um, Nicola, who's our friend as well recently, and he, he told me not to use the word social distancing anymore. He said to use physical distancing because he doesn't want people to socially distance and I'm happy we can all connect in this way. Um, up next, we're going to have um, Thomas Shai from Tacony Academy Charter School. And I'm going to join um, with him because Tacony Academy is a school near and dear to my heart. Um, it's formerly an administrator at Tacony, and now I work with American Paradigm Schools, a uh, management charter organization that supports four charter schools in Northeast Philadelphia. Uh, we started uh, Tesla Clubs in our K-8 school, and Mr. Shai is going to talk to you a little bit today about his work at Tacony High School and our plan for Tesla Clubs. Hello, everyone. Um, as Ashley um, introduced me, I'm Tom Scheid, uh, the CEO for Tacony Academy Charter School. And for those that are wondering what this title CEO has to do with the school, it's the term we use as the head of the school in the charter world. Um, and our school is a public uh, school in, within Philadelphia, and we serve students uh, through a lottery system, meaning that there is no preferential um, acceptance in the school. We reach out to all the students in our community. Um, at the, uh, our entire enrollments, about 1,200 students, and at the high school, we have 400 students, um, about 100 students per grade. Um, as Ashley noted, at the elementary school, we've, we've had a Tesla club in operation uh, for a number of years in a partnership with the Tesla Science Foundation. Um, our school um, mission and vision is connected directly to uh, Tesla's um, life and uh, work and that we really work to, to create uh, critical thinking and problem solving with our students. Um, we we, we uh, support and hope to create students who think um, and develop original in thinking and also inventions and try to figure out solutions to problems. And um, as we all know, in, in today's world, we have a lot of problems that need to be solved. 
And so we really hope to do that. Um, specifically at our high school, uh, we uh, implemented a new program um, that is an extension of what the work we've done at the elementary school. And so all of our ninth graders, so a hundred of our ninth graders are now in a pre-engineering introduction engineering program in which they are working to um, in those problem solving skills. And so the program is a hands-on uh, environment, hands-on learning in the classroom and really is working to, to help the students think about how they can uh, connect to the real world and, and support um, the needs of society, which in, in turn is, is Tesla, was Tesla's mission as, and is the mission of the foundation. And so um, all of our students are in the program and as a connection to that, we are bringing in the Tesla uh, Science Club Foundation Club into the high school and further that that program. And the program that we have really is mission is is right in line with what what we're doing and is empowering tomorrow's problem solvers today. So we don't we can't wait for for the magic solution. We have to actually uh, take the skills that we have right now and work with the students we have to move move things forward for local solutions to problems as well as um, global global solutions um, to the greater world. And so um, with that, I would like to share um, a video which shows what we've done in the elementary school and what we plan on doing at the high school level. And our program at the high school will, will eventually encompass the entire school um, with the program in um, pre-engineering and in the STEM fields. So if um, Craig could share the video from the elementary school, that would be great. Yeah, Tom, do me a favor. Just could you expand for a few more moments? I have to get that video up and running again, please. I'll be right with you, okay? Sure. Craig, I think I have it here. Let me share. Okay, we want to show you our elementary school work. So I've so I've got it up and running as well. If you'd like me to share, I can't hear sound on yours, so I can I can share it if you like. Got it, thanks, please. Okay, all right, thanks very much, everybody. Thanks for your patience, everybody. The Academy Charter School. We're a K-12 charter school in, in Philadelphia, and our uh, specialty for our school is innovation, inventions, and technology. So originally I started working with the Tesla Science Foundation with the idea of getting real inventors, engineers, and other programming into our school. However, as the partnership continued, um, where we've had some members from the Tesla Science Foundation come and do assemblies, we've had family nights, we've started a Tesla club, and we started to realize the things we're doing here, even though it's our specific mission in a charter school, that really it could expand to other schools. What we're working on with the Tesla Science Foundation is to find some ways to present Tesla's legacy, Tesla in the past, the present, and the future that would be able to be more accessible to other schools.
what we've been doing at Taconi is working on different projects and we would like to at this point start to share them, get other people involved, other schools involved. <music> My name is Shine Daniel and I attend school at Taconi Academy Charter School. Something I really liked about Nikola Tesla was that he was really humble about his inventions and didn't do it all for profit. We have our own science lab which has microscopes and pan balances and lots of other scientific tools. My name is Zina Ahmed and I attend Taconi Academy Charter School. What I really like about Nikola Tesla is that he was a great role model and a great person to look up to because he persisted on accomplishing his dream even going through tough times. What we're going to be doing is taking a group of children at our lunch time and during their class time we'll cut apart and teach them about Nikola Tesla. We have Tesla Science Club, which is like an after-school program where like, we can do experiments and do different things and learn more about Tesla. So thank you for watching our students as they talk about their work. Um, I'm almost getting a little teary because I miss being in the schools and being able to do things hands-on. So I'm so glad that uh, we're able to at least connect virtually. But definitely miss seeing those kids that were on the video. Um, thank you so much, Tom, for sharing today and joining us here and for your work with Taconi Academy and really excited to see what this looks like at the high school. And I'm sure that your high school will enjoy using the materials um, that we work on here today. So thank you. Thank you. Just an update for the group. Um, Unfortunately, we really had a hard time with our YouTube account and the um, security between Nicola and us. Um, so we are recording all of this. And if anyone um, doesn't get live streamed, we will be streaming the entire thing. So your um, presentations will be seen on our website as well as on YouTube after we get it um, up and running. We just didn't want to keep everyone waiting because we respect your time and what you've um, done to get ready for today. Um, next up, we have Jeffrey Dopkin. And um, Jeffrey has been a longtime member of the Tesla Science Foundation, our Director of Invention, and he's going to talk today about the um, invention process. Jeffrey, welcome. You can go ahead and unmute yourself there, Jeff. How's that? Great. We okay. can, can you hear me? Yep, thank we can you hear you. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, the tradition of Nikola Tesla and his passion for innovation and invention. Uh, throughout his life, he pursued his dreams and followed each idea through the path of its development, then gifted his revolutionary discoveries to the American public and to the world. At the Tesla Science Foundation, we honor Tesla as a person and is an innovator to seek and carry his tradition of discovery and invention further through the 21st century. It's our deepest regret that Tesla only saw a fraction of his visions come to life. Through our Science Foundation, we can realize and honor his dreams along with the discoveries of today's inventors. Please come with us for this journey. Just as Nikola Tesla, you can bring your ideas, dreams, and inventions to life. Through your own hard work and dedication to the process of invention, you can show the world that innovations are offered today. You can see our website for articles on starting up, invention development, prototyping, next steps, fast track marketing, patenting, license, and more. And you can see these on the Tesla Science Foundation website and also on my site, jeffreydopkin.com, under the inventions link. 
Um, I'm going to give you a one minute history of me, and then I'm going to talk about moving your own inventions forward. So I was on the board of directors of the American Society of Inventors for 14 years, and I was the president for four. And every month we reviewed inventions in uh, meetings twice a month. I was a speaker 12 times at the Yankee Inventor Expo. I was an initial board member of the United Inventors Association at their startup. I'm the author of seven books, mostly on marketing. And I have marketing articles that have appeared in more than 300 magazines. Um, I also am the founder of a brain injury foundation at braininjuryfoundation.org, where you can see my own innovations in moving uh, and delaying hypoxic acetic brain injury to uh, sudden cardiac arrest victims. At Tesla, I'm the Director of Invention and Innovation. I'm here to help inventors such as yourself at no charge. I'm not going to do your heavy lifting, um, but I will offer guidance based on where you are in your invention process, stage, goals, budget, and strengths. I'm a marketeer, not a magician. Please don't email me and say I have an invention, but I can't tell you what it is, but I need to know what to do now. You don't have to disclose what your invention is, but I do need more information so that I can offer you specific direction and help. I'm not going to recommend a $10,000 marketing campaign if you have $500 in your budget. And I'm not going to offer you a $5,000 marketing campaign if you have $100,000 in your budget. I salute you because you are the core of every product. Every product was once an invention and an idea in someone's mind. There are things that everyone needs to know, and I have a short list of them. What do you want to do with your invention? There's four paths that you can take. One is you can manufacture it and market it yourself. Uh, to this end, I've written a book, Low Cost Marketing Techniques, and also How to Market a Product for Under $500 that are available on my website, jeffreydopkin.com. As Ellis has offered, if you don't have money to buy the book, please email me and I'll send you a free copy. Uh, there is another option that you can have, and that is to license your new product or idea. You can also just have uh, the ability to make a few for your friends and yourself. And there's nothing wrong with that. Not every idea is commercial. The fourth thing is you can sit idly by and wait for someone else to develop it. And that's the only one I don't recommend. If you're going to commercialize your innovation, and that means sell it on an open market, it means it has to be commercially feasible. And that means you can make it and sell it at a competitive price. So you need to do a little homework there. Um, you need to look it up on Amazon, which is a great ref reference and research tool and see if your product is already listed there and what the costs are. Because if you're thinking of bringing your product in for $500 and you can buy one on Amazon for 50 bucks, then the likelihood of you being a commercial success is much less. What makes yours different, unique? What makes it better, cheaper, faster, or more expensive? Because some people like to buy things that are more expensive. There's absolutely a high-end market out there for products. Do you offer additional features? And what is your USP or your unique selling position? Those have to be, uh, you have to think about all those things when you are uh, bringing your product to market. You also need to know uh, market knowledge. And for market knowledge, I recommend doing homework in the magazines that serve the industries. You can go to any library at the reference desk and take out directories of magazines. And there's probably 10, 12, maybe 15, maybe 20 magazines that go to the specific industry of where your invention is. In some big industries, there are a few hundred publications. In the computer industry, there are over 500 magazines that go to the computer industry. 
This will give you an idea, a knowledge of different industries, cost breakdown for selling, retail, wholesale, direct selling, online, and direct mail, what all your cost breakdown are gonna be when you bring your product to market. Keep in mind that an idea is not an invention. An invention is not a product. There are stages to a commercial product development. And the first one is to make a prototype. Prototype is a proof of concept. You can have a working prototype, which means your concept works. You can have a final prototype, which is what it's gonna look like. You can have a manufacturing prototype, which is exactly how it's gonna be made. That goes into the length of all the screws, how big all the wires are that your product is, what kind of plastic it's gonna be made out of. Um, and the manufacture, simple parts and cost analysis and manufacturing costs, all those are necessary to bring your product to market. Because you have an idea or an invention doesn't mean you can start and run a successful business because they're very different. Um, it's like having a glass of water in your hand. It doesn't mean you can build a swimming pool. The next logical step for an inventor is not to manufacture and market his product. The next logical step for an inventor is to invent something else because they're inventors. And that's what they do is they invent things. They don't necessarily run businesses. I'd like to speak just for a brief about patents because so many people ask me about patents. I most of the time don't recommend a patent out of the hundreds, perhaps thousands of people who have brought uh, me to analyze their invention and where to go with it, I've recommended a patent maybe about 5% of the time, maybe 3% of the time. A patent does not protect you. Okay, that's a pretty important statement. A patent does not protect you. What a patent does is it gives you the right to protect yourself. And there's a big difference. Patent gives you the right to sue someone. So are you ready to sue someone? Are you going to sue somebody in Oregon if you live in Washington because they've infringed on your patent? It's a lengthy and costly process. There's also a lot of patents that are fairly worthless. A patent uh, protection depends on the strength of your claims. And um, what I would recommend is that you go to uh, the patent library, uh, the patent depository, there are 85 patent depositories around the United States and see if you can find patents that are similar to yours. You can also look them up on the patent website and see if there are other products that are very similar. Uh, and I suspect that you will find lots of patents right in your own backyard. There's a couple of different types of, of patents. One is a provisional patent and the patent, provisional patent, you can do this yourself. That's the way it was designed so that you can do it yourself. It's not really a patent, doesn't offer you protection, but it's rather a timestamp of when your invention was invented. Once you file a provisional patent, you have one year to patent a regular utility patent after filing this. So you should be aware that there is a time limitation once you file a provisional patent. On my website, I have an article, 17 tough questions to ask a patent attorney. So if you're thinking about getting a patent, I would recommend reading that article first. The two types of patents, one is a design patent, like the bottle of a Coca-Cola or a Jeep vertical grill. These are much simpler types of patents. The other type of patent is a utility patent, and it's how and why your invention works and why it's different. These can run anywhere from $5,000 and up. I think the most complicated and longest patent is an asparagus picker. And it runs, I believe if my memory serves me correctly, 236 pages. So there's all types of patents out there. Before you do any type of patent or call an attorney, I recommend you do a uh, search for prior art. Prior art is another name for a prior patent. Once you do this, and if you think that your claims are strong enough that you can build a patent around it, uh, you might consider it if you are really well funded, if your idea is very commercial, or if you're going to market or license it. 
whatever you do, you have to study the market, the magazines and the industries, the catalogs, so that you know if your product is gonna be welcome in that place. In finality, don't fall in love with your one idea. If you're an inventor, you have lots of ideas. Maybe the next one is gonna be that million dollar idea that you've been thinking about. Above all, have fun because it's about the process and not necessarily the end result that is meaningful in your patenting. I wish you all good luck and you're welcome to contact me at the Tesla Science Foundation. My name is Jeffrey Dopkin or at my website, jeffreydopkin.com. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jeffrey, and, and for your generous offers of support and for reminding us to enjoy the process. I think it's really important. I hope that you will um, enjoy having this part of your presentation shown for the students in the Tesla class. Thanks, Jeffrey. Um, next up, we have Mona Davina. Uh, Mona Davina is the um, director of the Divine Hand Ensemble and also the director of music for Tesla Science Foundation. He spoke to a number of groups about inventions and his music. Um, unfortunately, Mono was just too handsome to be on camera today. And so we're gonna have to hear his voice off camera and he's gonna speak a little off camera and then we have a great video of his to play. Mono. Hi folks, it's always a pleasure to see all of you. Yeah, sorry, my camera doesn't seem to be functioning. I'm not trying to be the mysterious shadow figure. Um, but um, as Ashley had just said, uh, I'm the musical ambassador for the Tesla Science Foundation and I'm the musical director for the Divine Hand Ensemble. And I also lecture on Tesla's contributions. Uh, this is my 11th year being part of the Tesla Science Conference at the New, York, New Yorker Hotel. And every other year, my group does a performance for folks. And I just wanted to start off by saying a message for my group. They miss you all. They were looking forward to performing for you all this year. And we look forward to returning to do a performance for everyone at the New Yorker next year. My group is called the Divine Hand Ensemble. And we are fronted by the Thurman, which is an instrument which is based on Tesla's technology. So. Let me take a moment to just uh, talk about what that is. A lot of people, even people who are very familiar with Tesla's inventions, don't realize his musical contributions. Um, he invented a device called an oscillator. What the oscillator is, is a small little doodad, these are the layman terms, of course, uh, that fix a frequency in one place and then align another frequency that can slide freely in and out of space and in and out of sync to alter its parameters. It's the same concept as we see with AC-DC uh, current and the diagram we saw earlier with the two sine waves. Um, this was the very first time anyone had ever thought to use electricity to make music, to use voltage control for sound. And this led to huge breakthroughs in the music industry amplification to start with. It also led to the synthesizer. It also led to sampling. Did Tesla know when he invented the oscillator that this was going to be that this was going to be a keystone uh, um, of electronic music? Did Tesla know when he invented this that this was going to be a tool that would be used for generations to come, for decades on, going into hundreds of years to actually advance music and musical technology? Or did he simply invent this key and say, this can unlock a lot of doors. I'll leave it for the rest of you inventors to try to figure out how to use it. Regardless, thanks to this invention, we uh, have electronic music and wireless technology now appearing in the musical world. The instrument I play, which you see before you there in the uh, screen share, is a theremin. You can see the inventor there with his hands up in the air. And uh, this is based on wireless technology based on Tesla's oscillator. He started off inventing a proximity alarm as a burglar alarm for Russians' prisons and ended up realizing that there was musical notes within the alarm. And he went and he tinkered with it a little more until he was able to create this instrument named after himself. Now it's rather complex because this is one of the world's first wireless instruments ever invented and is the world's first instrument and remains today the only instrument in the world you play without touching. 
So again, the layman's terms here, essentially what we're doing is we're trapping electricity between two electromagnetic fields controlled by those antennas. And the electricity is trapped within the air held and contained by electromagnetics. When I put my hand into that frequency, I close the circuit and it allows me to vibrate the air molecules. When I vibrate them to matching corresponding frequencies of musical notes, you get a musical note. A certain vibration will equivalent to middle C on the piano, and then another vibration will equivalent to D and so on. Someone who plays my instrument is called a thereminist, and our object is to vibrate the air molecules of the electricity in the electromagnetic fields to sound musical. Or as I like to say, it's singing electricity. I bend my hands to bend the electricity to make it sound like a, an opera singer. I believe we do have a video queued up that we'll get to shortly. And for those folks who would like to learn more, you can always visit our website at divinehand.net. Um, I think what's important about this is my instrument is now 100 years old. And when it was first debuted 100 years ago, people did not believe it. They had just learned about electricity and wires, let alone a wireless instrument. Uh, and now we are 100 years later, and few people have ever even seen this instrument perform. Uh, Tesla, again, did not invent the instrument, but invented the keystone for this and many more electronic instruments in the musical world of the last 100 years. And I always wondered, how well did he know what he was gifting mankind with the simple device of the oscillator? I, when I bend my hands, and I bend the electricity, and I make it sing, it registers to people who can't figure out how is this guy doing it? 100 years ago, when the inventor debuted this in France, they rioted. They did not believe in wireless technology, and they thought it was sorcery, which is kind of funny, considering we all carry uh, wireless phones in our back pockets today, and we kind of take this kind of technology for granted. But back then, it was considered witchcraft and electronic sorcery, and wireless technology was looked upon as some kind of weird magic, uh, especially in the musical world, where they had never encountered this before. So my job when I lecture to people, everything from kindergarten students all the way up to retired RCA engineers, is to explain how not only did Tesla contribute this amazing device that shaped modern music, but that it allowed this instrument to be invented that 100 years later, you still play without touching. If any of you would like to learn more, you can always contact me at divinehand.net. Uh, divinehand at divinehand.net is my email. And uh, we are available for anything that we can use uh, our, our musical contributions for to help you in Tesla world, whether it be demonstrations, themes, original compositions, or anything else. One last thing I'd like to add before we go to the video is this year on January 1st was the 100 year anniversary of the inventor unveiling this instrument with the Philadelphia Orchestra at the Franklin Institute. And next to the Tesla Science Bus was supposed to be a giant portrait of me performing on the original RCA invented thermon, which the Franklin Institute graciously brought out of their basement storage so I could be photographed with it. And it was going to coincide with the concert on New Year's Day, and it was going to uh, hang the portrait up next to Tesla, and I was going to allow me to have an entire year of concerts and presentations at the Franklin Institute, where not only was I promoting Tesla, but the uh, music of my group. We hope that that will resume in 2021, and that on New Year's Day in 2022, we can perform that concert. Until then, we only have videos to share with you. Uh, let's see what we have up here first. This is Under Pressure. And this is uh, us in quarantine. So I hope you enjoy our music.
Thanks for listening, folks. Thank you, Mr. That song really inspired um, many of us when it was first released out on YouTube to see you all coming together like that. Um, and definitely follow Divine Hand Ensemble on YouTube and Facebook and see many of the videos. Um, we'll play some more later on as we keep going through the um, program. Next up, we have two individuals who are both working with the Nikola Tesla Memorial Statue and Monument in Colorado Springs. Patrick Ryan and Stan Mullins. Stan Mullins is an artist who utilizes a renovated cottonseed oil factory and has literally created thousands of works of art. He has exhibited all over the globe and continues to pursue creative and artistic adventures. Patrick Ryan is an engineer and a US Army combat veteran who received a fine arts degree from the University of Georgia. He's been a producer, actor, director, and stage manager for various projects. He's currently writing the playbook series and graphic novel, Mark Twain and the War of Wizards, which is a dramatic story about Nikola Tesla and his rivalry with Thomas Edison. Working with famous artist and sculptor Stan Mullins, Patrick moved to Colorado Springs to build, dedicate, and donate a statue and monument of Nikola Tesla to the city of Colorado Springs. We would love to hear more about your project, gentlemen. Thanks for joining us today. Thank you for having us. Can you hear me? Thanks for having us. Can everybody hear us? We can hear you. We can well, hear hello, you. everyone. Pulling up your photos for you. I'm uh, Patrick Ryan, I and you. I am joining you today from Colorado Springs, exactly two blocks from where Tesla had his experimental station here in 1899. And so, how did I get introduced to Tesla? I saw a television show. I think it was Unsolved Mysteries made all these claims that he did this and he did that. And I thought to myself, well, how is it that I've never even heard of this guy? Not once was he ever mentioned any science or history class I attended in grade school or in college. So I got Mr. Mark Cipher's book. Mark is with us here today. And this is the first book I ever read on Nikola Tesla, Wizard, The Life and Times. And so I got cast in the play Amadeus which is about another famous super genius, Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart. And I'm backstage learning my lines. We're doing rehearsals. I'm reading Mark's book about Tesla, and I just had this epiphany. Tesla and Mozart shared the exact same type of genius. They used it very differently. They both spoke over eight languages. They both had photographic memories. Both suffered from a condition known as synesthesia and photostasia. That's where you see sound, you taste colors, that type of thing. And they both used a technique known as picture thinking in their creative process. So Mozart would picture the music in his head, work it all out. When it was perfect, he would just go and transcribe it. Tesla would picture his inventions in his head. He'd build them, rebuild them, test them. And when they worked perfectly, he would just go and build them. And I realized that not only did their geniuses mirror each other, so did their lives. Salieri was to Mozart what Edison was to Tesla. And so that gave me the inspiration to write the play Mark Twain and the War of Wizards, which is the story of Tesla and Edison narrated by Mark Twain. Stan Mullins is a friend of mine. He's a famous artist. He has this beautiful studio. Athens, Georgia, where I went to school, University of Georgia. And so he let me do my first stage reading there. And then I got invited to Colorado Springs to a writer's conference. And I thought, well, this is wonderful. I can track down Tesla's missing laboratory, go see any historical markers, and also attend the conference. And um, I will start the PowerPoint from there, and then I will pass this on to Stan. So. There we go. The Tesla came to Colorado Springs in 1899. He stayed at the Alta Vista Hotel, which no longer exists. But it is just a couple blocks from the Antlers Hotel, which is the main hotel downtown. 
This is a picture of his experimental station, which is just two blocks from where I'm sitting right now. There were only two buildings in existence when he built this. And in the background, you can see the Union Printer's home, which still exists today. So that helped people locate the site of the actual experimental station. This is another picture. And then we have Mr. Tesla himself peeking out of his experimental station. He's made himself a sign that says, great danger, keep out. This is that famous double exposure, iconic picture of Tesla with the electricity. Basically, they took the picture with all the electricity first and they shut everything off. And then Tesla went and sat down and they took another picture and they superimposed them both. But Tesla didn't tell everybody that he did that right away. So when Thomas Edison and other people try to recreate this, couldn't, which brought Tesla great amusement. This is a picture of some of the bulbs he lit wirelessly here in Colorado Springs. So the very spot I'm sitting in now might be where he put these bulbs to the ground. When we think of Tesla in Colorado Springs, most people think of the movie The Prestige and this iconic image from there. This is a picture of me where the experimental station was. So if you're in Colorado Springs, it's at the uh, intersection of Foot Avenue, and Bijou, uh, Foot Avenue and Kiowa Street, and it is now a neighborhood. Just one block from this neighborhood is Memorial Park. And I had this picture of the Tesla historical marker. So it was on my to-do list while I was here. I walked all over Memorial Park and did not find this marker anywhere. So I started looking at the tree line in the picture, and this is what I found. Remnants of two posts and the remnants of the cedar tree. So I grabbed somebody who worked in the park. I said, what happened to this historical marker? And he said, oh, um, we had a really bad windstorm, and the tree fell and it destroyed it. And I was just disheartened. So I think I posted on Facebook, can't my hero get a break? I mean, if Thomas Edison himself had come and cut that tree down to destroy the marker, I could accept that. But an act of God, it, was, it really bothered me. And so uh, Stan was the first one to respond to my post. And he said, well, Patrick, it's not like you don't know anybody who can't build a statue. And I said, wow, you would really do that, buddy? He said, absolutely. So when I got back to Athens, Georgia, uh, just so you know, Stan did the Herschel Walker statue for the University of Georgia. Chris, that's him and Herschel Walker. He did the Vince Dooley statue, for the university. That is him and Vince Dooley. He's done statues all over the world. It's him working in his studio in Athens, Georgia. He's currently working on Chief Tomachichi, which will be installed in downtown Atlanta. And so that was our first meeting. I was the person that really introduced uh, Stan to Tesla. And so I brought all my research materials and he said, well, what, what kind of ideas do you have for the statue? And so this is what I gave him. <laughs> and from, from this, nice. yep, yeah, from this, Stan um, designed made this design and I told Stan, I said, look, I don't want just Tesla in the statue. I want his assistant Coleman Zito because uh, Zito had actually saved Tesla's life one time by shutting off the apparatus when uh, Tesla was trapped in the laboratory. And so this was what Stan came up with from that uh, rendition I gave him and it's Tesla looking up the hill to where his laboratory actually was in Memorial Park. His assistant, Coleman Zito, is kneeling in front of him, putting a bulb to the ground. We, didn't, we couldn't find a picture of Coleman anywhere. So if anyone has a picture of Coleman, we would love to see it. So give Coleman a face. Most people in the world today are introduced to Tesla through the movie The Prestige. I'm talking layman. Uh, regular citizens, not scientists and such. And since David Bowie did a outstanding job depicting Tesla, and at the time Stan and I had met, Bowie had just died. I thought, well, 
wouldn't it be cool if we gave Coleman Bowie's face? So we're working right now with uh, the executor of his estate, to see if we can use Bowie for Coleman's face. And that is uh, David Bowie in the movie, The Prestige, that most people outside of true fans got introduced to Tesla. And then this is the pedestal stand design. So it's a granite base on top of a marble base. The marble base is going to look like um, Tesla's alternating current dynamo. And then the granite will have electricity coming out of it. And then I thought, well, we can't just build a statue. We have to do something Tesla himself would appreciate. And I saw a new product on the market. It was called 19 Crimes Wine, where people could use an app on their phone. And when they run their camera over the image, the image on the wine label comes alive and talks to you. And I thought, well, why can't we do this for the statue? So we would like to have augmented reality aspect to the statue. So if you have the app on your phone, you run your camera over the statue, the bulb will light up and Tesla will turn to you and tell you his story here in Colorado Springs. And then this is kind of, we might have a donor wall with that kind of looks like lit bulbs in the field because where the statue will be sitting in Memorial Park is exactly where Tesla was doing these experiments. Dan is in Athens and he is working on the statue as we speak. This is a miniature version and I'm quite pleased how it's turning out. This is the actual head of the statue that he's finished. And this is some of the work that's been going on in his studio back in Athens. If you would like to learn more about us, please take a screenshot of that all of our uh, contact information or use your phone. Um, if you want to learn about the play Mark Twain and the War Wizards or you want to help with the statue, we will be launching a crowdfunding later this year. And with that, I will turn it over to Stan. Thanks. Okay, Patrick, man, that, that was great. Wasn't it fun to hear the David Bowie song for Under Pressure? It was. I was, I was dying. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, that was that was so neat. This is really a neat honor to be with you guys, and um, thank you, Patrick, for um, taking the initiative and getting us involved, and Ashley and all the um, Tesla fans out there. Um, and literally, like the the process for sculpture and artwork folds itself nicely back into everything that everybody's talking about, in the sense of like the innovations, the inventions. And I love the way Patrick links Tesla to Mozart, because we don't always think of these things. Um, one of my biggest challenges as an artist is, is to educate my um, fan base, if you will, or, or my clients or whatever they are, my viewers, as to the thought process and how things go along. Um, so with that, I'm only going to correct you a few small items, Patrick. But we, we have the, um, the, the maquette, which is here. And what, what happens next is we, we're going to add some um, current technology in this process. We're going to use it. We'll 3D scan this image, and then we'll enlarge it in foam. And so what that foam enables me to do is rather than old school where it would be metal and armatures, and I'd have to build this, the foam it is, first of all, it's lightweight, it's cheaper, but it's also malleable that I can also carve in and out of that too. So we're at phase one of, well, we're mo moving into phase two of the sculpture process. So the um, only correction I'm going to make to you, Patrick, is that the head is not the finalized head. It's just another larger head than, than the two inch here. Gotcha. But re really, um, everything that we're doing is, is driven by you guys and the, and the fans. So um, real happy to be here. I don't, I mean, we're in my studio. I don't know if you can see behind, but it's a 7,000 square foot cottonseed oil refinery. And um, it's quite spacious to do some really cool work. And I'm considering Tesla as one of those really cool works. So I really can't wait to get going on it and um just wrapping things up i'd like to 
hand it off back to you, Patrick, and summarize what we've got going. And um, wish you all a very great rest of the event. And thank you very much for hosting us. So we're still working on site approval with the city of Colorado Springs. Um, I'm having to educate people on who Tesla was and actual things he did. Unfortunately, a lot of the city council members have been accosted by what I call Tesla crazies. And so as soon as you mention Tesla, the wall comes up. But slowly and surely, I am working my way um, through the various people that I would have to get approval for. Our state senator, Pete Lee, just happens to be my landlord. And he is 100% behind our project. And he can introduce me to the mayor and such. So we will be moving forward. Uh, a local distillery, two blocks from where we want to put the statue, would like to partner with me to do a whiskey with the statue's image on the bottle to help promote it. Uh, they're big Tesla fans. And so I'm going to wrap up, but I want to thank each and every one of you for helping with Tesla's dream to let the future tell the truth. So thank you very much. We're done. Thank you so much. You know, we start a lot of these conversations. Um, I see some people frozen. Can you all hear me? Can you give me a thumbs up if you can hear me? I can hear you, Ashley. I'm going to give okay, a quick shout you. out to Mark Safer, who I see just joined us. Your book was the first one I ever read, sir. I've been a big fan for a, many years, so thank you. Thank you all. Um, our, it's inspiring to hear so many people who are making um, different monuments and tributes to Nikola Tesla. As we start our work, we often talk about how uh, many of us did not know about Tesla through our traditional education programs. And when we hear about all the work that is happening around the world and in this group, it's inspiring to know that we're actually making a difference in that history. Dr. Francis Listingy um, is a president and co-founder in the tumultuous years of 2020, while statues across the United States were being defaced or toppled, the nonprofit Buffalo Niagara Nikola Tesla Council instead erected a statue in Buffalo, New York of our favorite New Yorker, Nikola Tesla. I would love to hear more about your project, Dr. Lissini. Hi, thank, thank you very much for this opportunity. And uh, Greg, thank you so much for helping last night getting this uh, slideshow in order. Uh, can you start it? Okay. <clears throat> yeah, just give Craig one minute. I know he'll be getting that started for you. Well, in line with uh, what uh, some others have said, uh, my story starts <clears throat> in New York. Nope, that's not it. <laughs> Can we go to the first one? Nope. All the way to the first one. Nope. <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, well, doctor, the, the order of the slides are gonna be out of order, if you remember that email. So I, I just put them in whatever order I thought made some sense. So you're just oh gonna have to talk. You, you have to talk of them as they appear, okay? Oh, because, uh, <laughs> yeah. All right, okay. Well, all right, it'll be a little disjointed then, that's okay. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, let me just say that uh, uh, I, my uh, beginning in this is in 1943 when Nikola Tesla died. I was there. I was six years old. I was a, the son of a, an immigrant from Italy. And I would never hear of Nikola Tesla for another 25 years when I was studying for a PhD with a minor in the history of science. And that's when I learned about Nikola Tesla. And then I, my first teaching uh, and last teaching assignment was at 
the State University College at Buffalo. And of course, I had learned all about the connection of uh, Nikola Tesla with Buffalo and the power project that brought electricity from Niagara Falls to Buffalo. And <clears throat> I consistently told my students that what a shame it is that the, the, uh, the man who changed the world through the city of Buffalo had not a street, a boulevard, an avenue, a lane, or even an alley named in his honor. Nor was there a building, a school, a mall, a park, or even a plaque dedicated to Nikola Tesla, who had changed the world and it started in Buffalo, New York. So what I did uh, with a couple of colleagues of mine, uh, three, three, uh, four years ago now, we started a nonprofit called the Buffalo Niagara Nikola Tesla Council. And our objective was to produce a statue of Nikola Tesla in a park across the street from the building in which he gave the keynote address in 1897 at a huge banquet where all of the uh, uh, donors and, and uh, uh, robber barons of the time came to celebrate this great achievement of the transmission of electricity from Niagara Falls to this great distance of 23 miles to Buffalo, New York. So uh, let me, if I can, if you can start some of the slides and I'll just tell you about them. Greg, can you start some of the slides? Are you unable to see the slides, doctor? No, I don't see anything. I see me and everybody else. Okay, I thought I screen shared that. Is there something I have to do? Nope. Up till now, I thought you were oh, seeing okay. the screen. Here, good. Now, <clears throat> this is uh, one of the interesting things and in how we had this uh, statue made. Uh, we contacted a company in Salt Lake City uh, by the name of uh, uh, Marble Cast Products, <clears throat> and they produced the statue for us. They said they would get the statue to us in uh, in the summertime. And it turned out because of COVID and because of a, uh, an earthquake in uh, Salt, Salt Lake City. <laughs> they, oh, can you slow these down? <clears throat> I, so, I certainly can, Doctor. Here's what's gonna happen. They are so out, they're so out of order. They're, yeah. So you're gonna go from the cement being poured to the, the castings being made to the yeah. statue erected. So as if you want me to start from the beginning of the slideshow, I'll do so. They're just really not in the order of, of chronological order. So All right. well, let me just finish this story because it's kind of interesting. And I, I can just go through, I'll just go through the slides one by one and, and we'll, well watch. Well, not, not yet. Let, let, okay. me, let me finish this and then I'll ask you to do that. Is that okay? Sure. All right. So. Uh, we were expecting the statue in, uh, in the summertime. Uh, and I was going to, as you will see from the design, I was going to gild the, uh, the lightning bolt. And we needed just a couple of days for that. But it turned out because of uh, COVID and an earthquake in Salt Lake City, they said it would arrive uh, on a Monday in September of the Friday that we were going to have the unveiling. And I only had, uh, I, I needed two days, but we only had one day now because of this problem of the delay. The installation was on a Wednesday and the unveiling was on a Friday and it was supposed to arrive on a Monday. And it turns out, <clears throat> I get a call and they said, they, they're, it's going to arrive on that Friday. And I said, absolutely no, you can't. So they said, okay, we'll get it to you on Monday, but we can't get it off the truck because we don't have the equipment. So at that point, I, I called my son who is very reliable and very strong. And we were able to get that crate off the truck 
and into the parking lot of the monument company, which by that time had closed and they couldn't help us. And what we had to do is to prepare the uh, lightning bolt for the gilding by sizing it while it was in the crate. And we're working upside down as you'll see in some of these pictures. The following day, I was able to gild it. And the next day on Wednesday, it was installed. And then two days later, we had the unveiling. All right, so now let's see some of the photos and I'll, I'll tell you about them. All right, well, this is at the uh, unveiling cere uh, ceremony, welcoming the guest. We all <clears throat> had seats that are six feet apart and wore, wore masks. This is the logo for our organization called the Buffalo Niagara Nikola Tesla Council. And what happened was I found a quotation from the Buffalo Inquirer newspaper in 1896 that said, it was the journey of God's own lightning to the employ of all mankind. That is the electricity brought from Niagara Falls to uh, Buffalo. So we got an endorsement from the past and we didn't even know it at the time. <clears throat> this is the plaque uh, that's on the, uh, uh, the pedestal. And the artist is uh, Mark D. Graffenreed from uh, uh, Marble Cast Products uh, in Salt Lake City. I was able to uh, uh, design it, uh, finance it, and be the project manager to get the whole thing done. But there were others that helped, and I'll show you their images later. Well, this is the this is the church where Nikola Tesla uh, had his funeral, and that's what was my opening remark that I was in New York City at the time. Uh, but I, I didn't hear about him for 25 years. And <clears throat> this is uh, the interior of the building in which uh, Tesla spoke. He walked up this stairs, these stairs to the banquet hall, which he was the, uh, the uh, prime speaker, the guest uh, lecturer in 1897. And this was the uh, newspaper article uh, calling uh, crazily uh, the weird electric genius of the 19th century, which I, was a terrible thing to say, but that's what they did. And I had uh, not thought of, the, uh, of uh, Zeus as the inspiration for the electric, uh, for the uh, lightning bolt. but there are many reasons why the lightning bolt. There, there's my original sketch, which was kind of crude, but you'll see what it turned into. This was the uh, Etiquette Square building where that banquet was held. The building was only two years old and it was the largest office building in the United States at the time. And here is the uh, initial model um, that was a, about a, a foot tall. And ultimately um, it turned into something like this, which is the clay model. With uh, great detail. And look at the, the magnificent uh, rendering of his face. And that's the clay uh, <clears throat> version. The previous one I showed you was the, uh, the cast version in bronze. And as you may know, uh, the statues are put together in, in, in uh, components and pieces. They do uh, the torso, the arms, the, the head, the legs, all separately, and then they weld them together. Uh, 
And uh, a month before the installation, uh, we had to put the, uh, the foundation in, which was a four foot cube. And this was all donated to us by the concept construction company of Buffalo. Oh, and there I am uh, doing some of the sizing of the, um, the lightning rod while it's in the crate on the ground on the, in the parking lot of the monument company. And there's my son, Stephen, doing, uh, helping at the same, with the same thing. And there he is um, getting the crate off the truck. And by the way, this was about 6.30 at night and we had to hurry before sunset. And then we had to leave the crate in the parking lot, hoping no, nothing would happen to it. This is the crate ready to leave uh, to ship to us. And uh, again, uh, some of the uh, continuation of the, um, the foundation. And then the, uh, this, this is the uh, pedestal which weighed three and a quarter tons. And that was placed on top of the foundation by um, the company called uh, Comb and Sons Monument Company. And there they are placing the, the statue on the pedestal. And there is yours truly with uh, Nikola Tesla. And after the installation, we draped the, uh, the statue in black cloth so that it would, it would be hidden for two days. And then we had the unveiling on uh, uh, September 20th. And you can see the statue is, uh, is uh, quite magnificent. There'll be more photos of, of the statue. wonderful shot of the building behind it. And we have this um, information panel, which tells all about uh, Tesla and the Buffalo connection. And this is a poster that I made uh, <coughs> welcoming Nikola Tesla back to Buffalo. And then on the left is Martin uh, McGee, uh, I'm next, and then Stephen Lestingy, and on the far right is Paul Swisher. Uh, these are the members of the uh, Buffalo Niagara Nikola Tesla Council. And uh, this is the park, and we have we managed to get the uh, the city of Buffalo. Uh, common Council to name this park, Nikola Tesla Park, and as far as we can detect, it's the only park in the United States dedicated uh, to him. And if you don't tell anybody, uh, we are in the process of trying to put a, a 10 or 12 foot high uh, replica of a Tesla to a coil, which will also serve as a, as a seating area. And that's in the works that will come eventually. And unlike New York, which only has a corner, uh, Buffalo, New York has a park named after Nikola Tesla. Okay, I guess that's the end of them. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. What wonderful work you're doing. And thank you for bringing positivity in a time of um, struggle for so many people. Really appreciate that. Thank you. Okay. Mostly, thank you all for being such a great group today and um, being patient with our technical issues and sticking with us and really being a nice, attentive audience for everyone. Um, one moment here. Okay. Up 
Next, we have Dr. Malina Tachik Baik, Director of Nikola Tesla Science Club in Chicago. And we are eager to hear about your work in Chicago. Thanks for joining us. We'll come off meet now. Hello. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much, Ashley. I appreciate uh, the announcement or the introduction. Um, yes. Uh, I am just so pleased. Oh my gosh, you know, all these incredible, wonderful people doing all kinds of wonderful things. Um, I am a clinical psychologist. So you might be wondering, what are you doing with Tesla? But um, Tesla has always been a favorite. Um, in Chicago in 2011, I became uh, uh, acquainted with or became part of the Tesla Science Foundation. And so we formed a Tesla club in Chicago where we had some Tesla days and we had wonderful, fascinating inventors and we had wonderful, fascinating um, uh, speakers who talked about uh, not only Tesla, but some of the things that came out of Tesla. Uh, Nicola Lonchard asked me to speak a little bit about these um, about these Nikola Tesla clubs that are being formed in schools. And as a psychologist, um, he asked me, "What do I think? How is it that we can motivate interest teachers to be part of these Nikola Tesla clubs?" And um, so I'll speak on that a little bit uh, just because uh, that is what he asked me to do. And so uh, part of the Nikola Tesla, Tesla's uh, realm, I, I think all of us who are here, at least if not everywhere that really does get to know Tesla, they're just um, uh, uh, incredibly interested, incredibly fascinated by such a thinker, such a mind, such an inventor, such an incredible human being um, that gave so much to the world. And so I think we're all in agreement where that is concerned. Um, I uh, spoke at one of the Tesla sound, uh, science conferences on Tesla's creativity. And in Chicago, we have a researcher who has done a lot, a lot of work on creativity. And his name is Mihaly Csikszent Mihaly. I'm sure that many of you may have heard of him. It's a really difficult name to pronounce, but I did it. Um, he talked about creativity as a, uh, as a flow. And so his focus has been to be able to decipher and look at creativity in different ways. And so uh, Nikola Tesla had both forms of creativity, which are convergent and divergent forms of thought. What does that have to do with the Tesla clubs? Um, the Tesla clubs in, in, in being able to talk to teachers to help them to know, hey, uh, we're gonna have you do these Tesla clubs to teach them and um, maybe they're a little overworked. Maybe they have done so much work that it's like, oh my gosh, you know, how do I do more now in the course of my day? And so a good place to start, I think, for teachers is to remind them, ask them, why did you go into teaching in the first place? And part of the why is because there's an excitement. Every learning is an incredible excitement. Um, I think one of our greatest teachers is Tesla as far as that is concerned. He just kept going, he had a focus, and he knew what he was gonna be able to do. So when you look at 15, they pulled 1500 uh, CEOs of companies and they asked uh, these, um, uh, these CEOs, what is the one factor that you're really looking for in the next group of people that you wish to hire? And they always say creativity. So if we were to look at these clubs as a way to help children 
children access that creativity? Because for years, many teachers had wondered, you know, how do I teach creativity? How do I do that? I mean, isn't that something that's inborn, inbred? Uh, we can't teach that stuff. But yes, you can. There are, there's a specific skill set. And I think if we uh, go back to um, what I think it was Ellis who was talking about the, um, the uh, My Inventions biography of Tesla, when he talks about himself and, and uh, the hallucinations, so to speak, because they're not uh, hallucinations, uh, they are ways of him to be able to imagine the experiments in his head so that way he then forms a step-by-step -step method of working it out inside of his head and then being able to have an output, right? So if we're to tell these teachers, you have an enthusiasm. Now, I would ask all of you, what made your favorite teacher your favorite teacher? And if you really think about it, it was the enthusiasm that that teacher had about whatever it is that they were teaching. It's the single greatest thing that we can give to children. And that is we have a passion for what it is that we're doing. And so if we can remind teachers, remember the passion, because everybody who is a teacher loves to teach. There's something about leaving or creating or helping someone unleash their own knowing and becoming something or doing something or whatever. It's teaching so that way a person can learn and, and being part of that. Wow, what a reward that is. And so if we can help teachers to know that they can unleash their own creativity in these Tesla clubs that they can help these children formulate divergent forms of thought, not just the convergent, con uh, if I can clarify, convergent forms of thought, I'm sure that many of you know what it is. Uh, convergent forms of thought are things that are for testing, you know, so memorize this, memorize that, and then we're good at these tests. But divergent thought is something that comes um, comes, you know, for example, they did this, uh, uh, they did this work with a bunch of kindergartners, and they asked the kindergartners, what will freeze inside of this classroom? So what the children did is they looked at glue, they looked at whatever was in the classroom, water, uh, vinegar they had in the classroom, they had paper, they had solids. And these kindergartners were really brilliant in that uh, they took out things that were kind of liquidy, you know, so the glue and, and, and water and vinegar and, um, and even the paper was always on this list. They knew ahead of time that the solids would not freeze. And when they came back indoors and they found out, hey, the paper got stiff and the vinegar did not freeze. And then they were able to talk about it. They were able to address um, what is it about that? Uh, as educators, we need to be willing to do things a little bit differently, willing to unleash our creativity with these students um, because there is a way to be able to develop this. And as we go into the future, you just don't know in these Tesla clubs, which child is imagining all kinds of things, much like Tesla did. Um, and if you as the teacher says, go ahead, try it. That's wonderful. That's terrific. That's exciting. Imagine what would have happened to Tesla, you know, if, uh, even back then, if he was told, hey, good going, that's an excellent idea. Let's try it out. But many, uh, many teachers, sometimes if they're too tunnel focused, they're not allowing their own creativity to come out, which then would uh, unconsciously affect 
these children. I know that my favorite teachers were always teachers who had a lot of passion for what it is that they did. And that, that definitely, definitely energetically moved toward me and created a desire and a love of whatever it was, even advanced statistics. When I took advanced statistics, if you can believe that, but I had a teacher who was just so fabulously excited for, um, uh, for doing what it is that he was doing. And he gave me a love for statistics in a way that no one else could. I thank all of you. You're all wonderful magicians of this world. God bless you. Thank you so much. We are um, really happy to have someone with that perspective of education and what meaning this can add to um, students and everyone. Thank you. All right, I'm, I'm really excited. Our, our next group is um, a group that uh, have been honored to um, start some work with this year. And hopefully we can continue our collaborations. Um, it's a group in Serbia from the Tesla Science Foundation in Serbia. And one moment, as I pull up, I want to make sure I get everybody, don't miss anyone. We're going to be talking about establishing and developing a Nikola Tesla clubs in the schools of the U.S. and Serbia. And we are going to hear from Peja Karasovic, um, who's the president of Tesla Science Foundation in Serbia. And we're also going to be hearing from Yelana Sheehan, our project coordinator. We'll be hearing from Sasha Jeptik, who's the general manager and school director. And we have a video presentation of the Tesla Science Race by Alessandro Ignavinci. And I'm so sorry if I did not get everyone's names right. I'm really trying hard and I hope you will correct me so everybody can be honored appropriately. So Prajra, can you take it away, please? Yes, uh, thank you, Ashley. You said it uh, all uh, very, very good. Uh, hello to everyone. Uh, I'm glad to be able to greet you in front of the Tesla Science Foundation in Serbia and to wish you good health and success in 2021. The branch of Tesla Science Foundation in Serbia has existed since May 2013 and has so far realized a large number of events in honor of Nikola Tesla. The most important event is certainly the annual conference that is held every year in Belgrade on the day of marking the birthday of Nikola Tesla, as well as the competition of elementary and high school students in knowing Tesla character and work. We have also organized several exhibitions of artworks inspired by Tesla, and we are working on the formation of Nikola Tesla clubs and Nikola Tesla inventor clubs in Serbian schools. We recently accepted an extraordinary talented young man in our team whose success and achievements will be discussed in Serbia and in America, namely Tesla Science Foundation based in the city of Philadelphia had the opportunity to start cooperating with, with Alexand, Mr. Alexander Ignatovic, whom we awarded with the gold medal of the Tesla Science Foundation for the success achieved with the project Tesla search for inventions. It is an interactive social game of an educational character, which primarily provides children with the, the opportunity to develop their own skills, tactics, and potentials by the method of choice, and to educate themselves about one of the greatest minds of all time, Nikola Tesla. In the next minutes of the conference, you will have the opportunity to go through a promotional film prepared by our colleague Alexander Ignatovic, otherwise the Innovative Educational Project Coordinator of the Tesla Science Foundation. See for yourself what kind of innovation it is. During the previous year, Tesla Science Foundation in Serbia worked intensively on the formation of the first Nikola Tesla Club and Nikola Tesla Inventor Club in Serbia, which will be discussed later by Jelena Sheehan, project manager, 
and Sasha Jertic, director of the elementary school Dragomir Marković from the city of Kruševac in Serbia, who will together with his colleagues present to you how they imagined the realization of that project. On behalf of my colleagues from Serbia, I greet you all and wish you all great success in your further work. Thank you very much. At this time, I'll play your video, Doctor. Okay. Okay, it would be okay. He wants to wait till the end, Craig. Okay, it would be film now, and after that, uh, Miss Sheehan, and after that, uh, Mr. Yertich. Okay, thank you. All right, Clarity, would you like me to play it now? Yes. 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 Thank you, Craig. awarded the project a the Tesla Science Foundation in Philadelphia awarded the project a gold medal in this adventurous quest the players visit places which Tesla himself visited while going through scientific rooms scientific conferences visiting Niagara Falls and even meeting Tesla's pigeon while using avatars of young scientists they are tasked with collecting as many of Tesla's inventions as possible Using the inventions they collect, the goal is to put together the photo of the Tesla coil, one of the most significant of Tesla's inventions. Two to four players can take part in the game. Each player chooses an avatar, selecting from the four young male scientists and the four young female scientists. The game can be played with or without the help of smart devices. If using smart devices, QR codes help bring the adventure to life using animations. If playing without smart devices, the deck of instructional cards are used to enjoy the game. The player who is first able to put together the photo of Tesla's coil gets a recognizable achievement. Accept the challenge, Tesla's science race. Pertini Toys. Thank you. We have uh, Yelena Shia next. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Ashley. Thank you, Ashley. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I'm honored and very pleased to share with you a few interesting facts about the pilot project's uh, establishment of Tesla clubs in primary and secondary schools in Serbia, following the example of such established clubs in the United States. Mm, last year, Tesla Science Foundation in Serbia launched the idea of founding Tesla's clubs in Serbia as part of the school system in primary and uh, we hope so uh, secondary school also based on already established logistic in the way of education, educating American children. Uh, after seven years of experimental work with the, with the, the Techni Academy Charter School, American Paradigm Schools and Franklin Institute from Philadelphia on the project introducing Tesla to schools in America under the gui guidance of director of uh, Tesla Science Foundation US, Ashley Redfern. We are overjoyed to have such a partner in developing the idea and work in Serbia. It is especially interesting, not only for America, but also for the whole world, that the most important parts of this project are going exactly to the country of Tesla's people. However, the programs we develop will be available to all schools in the whole world for free. Tesla's clubs in America have been giving outstanding results in additional children's classes for years. They introduce students through arts in a subtle and creative way, which gives great results. Our wish is to encourage the same way of thinking among the youth in Serbia through transfer of knowledge by using successful examples of innovation 
and entrepreneurship of which the of over which the American society is uh, built. The need for greater innovation, creativity and knowledge and their application in real life and society is the greatest value uh, that we want to share through networking of American Serbian Tesla's clubs. In order to successfully start to pr the project, the next issue in the organization was find a partner, school or schools in Serbia, which would work together in cooperation with Tesla Foundation. Luckily, we found the school very quickly, thanks to Sasha Jevtic, the director of the elementary school, Dragomir Marković from Kruševac, who was the first to offer us his help and many years of experience in organizing similar extracurricular activities for talented children in Kruševac. We quickly organized the first Tesla club, which currently has 20 interested children aged between eight and 14. Thanks to good connection and dedicated work of Sasha Jevtic, uh, we quickly established cooperation with another elementary school, Branislav Petrovic from Slatina near Čačak, and their director, Lazar Čikiris. They also organized the Tesla club with about 20 children instead uh, interested in, in, in this type of uh, teaching activities. Our goal is to organize a healthy environment filled with entertainment, not only for students and teachers, but also for their parents. Uh, we are planning to have a various kind of exhibitions of the works by member of Tesla clubs on the subject of uh, Tesla and his work from inventions uh, to art and paintings, literary works, uh, drama, and those will uh, all be open to the public. And why is this so important to us? Um, during the development of the pilot project of founding Tesla's clubs in Serbia, we want to draw the forward. public's attention to- I don't have a forward. Okay. Exceptional importance of encouraging, uh, encouraging creativity and innovation, especially among young people in primary and secondary schools, taking into account that our project is fully adapted to people with disability, disabilities and socially vulnerable categories of society. Uh, through their activities, uh, the participants of Tesla's clubs will encourage each other to find the best possible situations or solutions. So we will continue to promote this type of activity by connecting members of Tesla's clubs all over the world. We are especially happy with the director Sasha Jevtic, enthusiasm and dedication and other teachers of Dragomir Marković School from Kruševac and Slatina which has been participating in this establishment and development of Tesla clubs in Serbia. Thank you all for attention. And I hope that this year will have uh, a lot of reasons to be proud of our joint successes. Thank you. Thank you so much, Helena. Now we have Sasha Jeptic. Thank you so much, Sasha. Welcome. Hello, everyone. I will share my screen, please. As a representative of the school, Dragomir Markovic from Krušovac, and the uh, teaching staff of our school and the uh, partner primary school Branislav Petrovic from Slatina near Čačak, who organize and implement the same ideas and the working standards of the Tesla Science Clubs together with us. I would like to greet everyone participating in this conference. Next speaker, Bojan Miletic. 
Hello everyone, uh, my name is Bojan Miletic, I'm a school teacher and I'm a member of Tesla Club in my school, Dragomir Markovic Primary School in Kruševac. It is a great honor and a privilege to be able to participate in such a conference organized for a number of years by the TSF and from recently to be a partner on this for us very important and dear project. Because of the current situation with COVID-19 pandemic throughout the world, the implementation of the standards into the work of Tesla clubs and their organization is going slowly, but we can still say a few things that speak in favor of good ideas in the first place, and second, great cooperation between the representatives of TSF in Serbia as our main source of logistics on this project and TSF in the US, without whose help in teaching materials, as well as help in organization, nothing of this would be possible. We wish that this year brings us a lot of nice activities at school, the exchange of knowledge and energy, which will result in success of our children, both in Serbia and in America. The pilot project Tesla Science Clubs is based on following activities, online trainings, workshops, creation of website platform, online conferences, practice of game knowledge, practical working workshops, the organization of literary course, art course, competing through quizzes, knowledge competitions, theme-based excursions to relevant locations and institutions that have close ties with educational field of Nikola Tesla and so on. Because of the current COVID-19 pandemic, the activities and educational process of the newly formed Tesla clubs are organized online in agreement with the laws and procedures of the government of the Republic of Serbia. But as soon as the health situation allows, we are going back to the standard development program of education of our children together with monitoring and support of our teachers and members of Tesla Science Foundation in Serbia and America. What makes us particularly proud is the fact that children from Serbia win first prizes and medals on global competitions in different fields. By making it possible for them to take part in training workshops in Tesla science clubs in the fields that interest them the most, we will further encourage their interest and creativity, especially in direct contact with their peers from America. They would acquire different skills and knowledge and further spread their fields of interest. The need for greater innovation, creativity and knowledge and their compatibility with the real world is the fundament and the greatest value we want to share through making a network of American Serbian Tesla Science Clubs. I'd like to greet everyone present. We are continuing our work and cooperation with you. Thank you and take care. Wow, many congratulations to you and your team for that work. I know how hard you uh, You've been working to implement that um, from our calls and work together. And, um, you know, this type of work is not easy when we're working between um, different countries and especially all you're dealing with in your schools, as we know, and all of us are dealing with with COVID restrictions. So very happy, very proud um, to have you all partner with us. Um, so Let's see here, we are ready to go next and give me one minute so I get everything right. Okay. No, it's you, Christine. Okay, we have um, Christine Galley, who's the director of Tesla Biohealing. And um, Christine, I have not met you before this, but all I know is Nicola Lontar was super excited um, to find out about your work and really excited to have you share today. So welcome. Thank you so much for having me. Hi everyone, my name is Christine. I'm one of the directors for Tesla Biohealing and I'm very, very happy to be here with you all as we celebrate Nikola Tesla's contributions to the world together. So I'll go ahead and share my screen and I'll tell you what Tesla Biohealing is all about. So one minute here. Okay. Can you all go ahead and see the presentation? Yeah. Okay, great. 
All right, so I'm sure you're all very familiar with this quote and harnessing the forces of nature to the service of mankind is exactly what we have accomplished here at Tesla Biohealing. So the science behind the healing. Tesla Biohealing has created FDA registered over the counter medical devices that generate a field of pure life force energy. Nikola Tesla originally discovered how to harness this vital force of nature, and we are carrying his vision forth in order to create powerful therapeutic solutions for the modern day medical community. The type of life force that's generated by our devices has been proven to recharge and repair cellular tissues throughout the body. This type of energy increases the millivolt levels and ATP levels of the cells, promotes natural detoxification, provides natural pain relief, and even acts as a natural antidepressant and much, much more. Everything we do at Tesla Biohealing is data-driven. We've been conducting studies for the past three years and seen life-changing results take place in over a thousand people. We've seen stroke patients regain movement in their paralyzed limbs, rapidly improve motor function and speech patterns, and have even measured remarkable increases in brain cell repair rates. Dementia and Alzheimer's patients are able to increase mental clarity, improve cognitive function, and their family members often report to us that their mood is lifted within days of utilizing our devices. We have seen blood sugar levels normalizing and becoming more manageable, both for type one and type two diabetes and have measured blood glucose levels returning to normal in as little as two hours of use. COPD patients are able to breathe much better, often in a very short amount of time. Our devices help to rapidly open the airways and ease breathing while facilitating cellular repair of the lungs. Pain reduction is one of the most immediate and common results of utilizing our devices. People with a variety of conditions note significant pain reduction, increased mobility, finally being able to sleep without waking up in pain, and even requiring less pain medication, and sometimes none at all. Our products are even powerful enough to help people with terminal cancers dramatically improve their vitality and improve their overall quality of life. Now I'll go ahead and introduce you to our product lines. Our entry level devices are our Tesla Bio Healers. These are portable units located or excuse me, indicated for mild to moderate conditions, but they can be compounded to address more serious conditions. The more serious the condition, the more life force energy is needed to address it properly. We have biohealers with specific energy quotients tailored for adults, children, and even pets. All Tesla biohealing products are very easy to use. Simply place them near you to ensure your body is within the sphere of life force energy and once you're within that field, your cells will be able to uptake this life force naturally. Our MedBed generators are, are our most powerful treatment solution. These generators are over 100 times stronger than the biohealer units, and they are specifically intended to address the most severe conditions in the shortest amount of time. Simply place the MedBed generators underneath your current bed frame. The devices create an amplified and very powerful life force energy field. Just by laying on your med bed, the cells of your body will uptake this healing energy and utilize it where healing is needed most. Cellular repair rates have been noted to increase drastically even after one night's sleep on a med bed. Med beds are therapeutic solutions like no other. A completely non-invasive, natural, life-giving energy enhancing the natural cycle of sleep enhancing the natural healing cycle of sleep and all you need to do to experience the benefits is just go ahead and relax the energy will take care of you we're getting remarkable feedback every day and i'll go ahead and just share a few of our testimonials here here we have a terminal cancer patient who after using our technology for only two weeks was able to stop taking his pain medication his pain level went from a 10 down to a zero and of course his doctors and family were blown away we have another case here of someone suffering from COPD. After having a device near her for only five minutes, she was able to experience a significant improvement in her breathing that surprised everyone in the room. 
This is a testimonial from a stroke patient who went from being bedridden to being healthy enough to travel the country. After using our devices, she reported being completely seizure free. She no longer has crippling headaches, vision or balancing issues. And she's no longer constantly worrying about her health. She's very grateful to get her life back and we were very happy to help her. Here's a scan of another stroke patient's brain. This person had been paralyzed for 18 months. She didn't experience any real benefit from any treatment course she had done, but then she found us. After only six nights of sleeping on a med bed, the stroke affected side of her brain increased its cellular repair rate by 33%. For the first time in 18 months, she could eat and walk by herself again. All right, so how many of you would like to experience significant health improvements without changing anything about your lifestyle? Well, Tesla Biohealing has made that dream come true. As you can see here, after sleeping on a med bed for only three nights, this person's cardiac cellular repair rate increased by 30%, while his cellular destruction rate decreased by 100%. So that is possible, although even without a change to your daily routine, but of course we still encourage practicing a healthy lifestyle. So now that you've gotten a glimpse of what's possible with Tesla Biohealing, I invite you to visit our website at www.teslabiohealing.com to learn more about this breakthrough medical technology, which of course would not be possible without the unparalleled brilliance of Nikola Tesla. Thank you guys so much. Thank you, Kristen, that was great. We're excited to hear about your work. Um, you, have to stop the you have to stop the screen share, Kristen. Oh, thank you. <laughs> there we go. Okay, we are going to be going um, on to uh, the next section of our program. And we're very lucky today to have um, some different experts in Tesla. Um, Kristen, I think you are still screen sharing. I don't mind if I... Thank you, perfect. Um, Dr. Safer, are you here? Are you ready? He was here. All right, perhaps we do go to Dr. Quorum's presentation and then come back to Dr. Safer if he's not here. Okay. Oh, no, I see him on the um, screen. Dr. Safer, can you see us? There he is. Hi. Yeah. Um, we are very lucky to have Dr. Safer with us. Um, he is an author and expert on Nikola Tesla. He is going to talk today about his new upcoming book. And um, I know that everyone who has um, read his books before and um, heard from Dr. Safer before um, really enjoys his expertise. Um, and um, we're going to be using Dr. Seifer's books with our Tesla clubs um, when it comes out this spring. So, uh, Craig, if you have Dr. Seifer's presentation ready. I do. Here it comes. When I wrote Wizard, the Life and Times of Nikola Tesla, my main goal was to establish what was Tesla's real role in the inventions of the induction motor, electrical power distribution, fluorescent and neon lights, and artificial intelligence. The story is so intriguing, I realized that there were missing parts. There were other things that were worth talking about. Tesla played a big role in three major wars. And I put all this information into this new book called Nikola Tesla, Wizard at War, where I discuss Tesla's relationship to the Spanish-American War. Tesla had invented the remote control robotic boat, which he saw actually as a mechanism to end all wars. In World War I, he had wireless communication, and I discuss at length Tesla's role in relationship to people like Marconi and other inventors. And in World War II, Tesla had his particle beam weapon, and I discuss the two possible 
top secret weapons that would be working on by the U.S. government, the atomic bomb and Tesla's particle beam weapon. And after he died, there's a great mystery as to what happened to his papers. And this book really gets into solving a lot of the mystery of what happened to Tesla's secret papers. So I'm very happy with the new book, Nikola Tesla, Wizard at War, and I hope you will enjoy the book as well. also have a PowerPoint from Dr. Seifer, if you wait one moment for us. Dr. Seifer is coming to us from Rhode Island today. Uh, PowerPoint's coming up now. And we're very happy to have you here. Okay, so... Uh, I just start talking, right? Craig will be advancing your slides for you. So whenever you see it's at the right spot, do you feel free to start. Okay. Yeah, so uh, this is the first slide, Tesla Wizard at War. And then uh, we could go to the next slide. Just, just one second, okay? Thank you, all fun. Well, the next slide is uh, a picture of my book, my, my first book, which is uh, Wizard, Life and Times of Nikola Tesla. Yeah, next slide. Here we go. And um, this book started actually in 1976. I had never heard of Tesla's name until... Uh, that at that time, I was working on a, an entirely different project, and I was in New York City, and I came across a story about a man who was born from the planet Venus who had given us all these inventions, fluorescent lights, remote control, wireless communication, induction motor. His name was Tesla, and I thought that was pretty crazy. But when I started to look at, uh, I was in the library, I figured why not really uh, see if this guy really existed, and I found out he really did exist. And then I got a book of his patents. And once I got a book of his patents, I knew I was sitting on a huge story. But what I needed to do then was to find out why his name disappeared and whether or not he really was the inventor of, for instance, the radio or the hydroelectric power system. So I went into the heart and soul of all of those uh, inventions. And at the time, this is through the 1970s and 1980s and even the early 1990s, there was a lot of animosity towards Tesla. They were uh, scientific people who are claiming that someone else invented uh, the induction motor. And even today, there are books being written now which cloud the issue uh, coming from uh, universities like Princeton University. Um, so this was a very important thing for me to do to document everything. There's about a thousand endnotes in here and about 400 letters written. Okay, the next slide. This is the same book, Wizard, in Chinese. It's been translated into about eight languages uh, and it's just neat to open up the book and see the whole thing in, in Chinese. Okay, next slide. So what happened was um, after finishing the book, I finished the book in 1996. Um, I continued to lecture and continued to do research and certain questions began to arise in me. And one of the things I started to focus on was what was Tesla's relationship to all the, the different wars that he interacted with? And the first major war that he interacted with was the Spanish-American War. And so in 1898, he showed his remote control robotic boat and that on the left there is Madison Square Garden. And uh, this boat though, is a very complicated uh, mechanism. I think he deserved the Nobel Prize just for this boat. Uh, let's look at the next slide. And here you see some of the uh, detail inside the, the boat. Um, there's actually a logic board in here. And he really is uh, the inventor or one of the inventors of what becomes uh, just uh, how, how computers operate. Computers use, use a binary code. 
And in the developing this new book, uh, Wizard at War, I found out that what Tesla did was he aimed the rudder of this boat in one direction and had a counter spring in. So if he shut off the, uh, the current, the, the uh, rudder would move back to the other side. And, and then if he put the current back on, the spring would come back into play and it would go, into, go back to the other side. So you could actually steer the boat by turning the current on or off. So steering a boat is a very complex process. And he reduced it down to an on off switch, which is a binary code, which is the uh, foundation of computers. Okay, uh, next slide. Um, now what Tesla did there, if you, if you look at that boat, you, he had two antennas that were going up. These were two different frequencies. And the reason why he has two different frequencies is because he doesn't want interference. That was one of the complaints of someone, you know, you set out a remote control torpedo boat and someone else uh, takes over and then it, you could have the boat turn around and bomb your own ship. So he wanted to create protected privacy. And what he did was he figured out how to combine different frequencies. Once he multiplied frequencies, he was able to realize that he could create an unlimited number, an unlimited number of wireless uh, channels. And this, of course, he told Morgan in 1901, he said, I can create an unlimited number of wireless channels. This um, John Hayes Hammond Jr. called the prophetic genius patent and is the basis basically of cell phone technology. It is the way for every single person on the planet to have their own uh, uh, telephone. Um, and so that is all part of this one invention. Also though, he said that this was an invention that was a prototype of the first thinking machine. So when we see people, the kids playing with remote control boats or, or cars or trucks and they're zipping around, Tesla saw that that machine had intelligence inside it, built inside it. So this was a very complicated uh, invention. Um, you look at the garage door opener or the TV remote, that's all linked uh, to this as well. And obviously the radio, and as I mentioned, cell phone technology. Um, okay, next slide. This was an article uh, and you can see Van Eva Bush's name here and he, he will show up later in this story uh, of a thinking machine which Bush created in 1927. Uh, Van Eva Bush started the Raytheon Corporation and he was a, the Dean of uh, uh, the uh, Physics Department at MIT. And uh, as I said, his, he will come in, back into this story uh, later on, but obviously he knew about Tesla and he knew about Tesla's remote control robotic boat. Okay, next slide. Yeah, here we see the idea of a machine that could think. There was a, a book uh, written by Bulwer Lighton at the time, where he talked about drill power, the coming race, and it was a race of robots. And we're living in that right now. In fact, Tesla actually even wrote about cars that would drive by themselves. I found an article by that about that. And so that that's the world that we are entering. And he was, you know, the first inventor of, of the physical uh, robot. But Bulwar, Bulwar Lighton came up with that idea about 20 years before. Bulwar Lighton was uh, the most famous author next to Charles Dickens. He was uh, the guy who, who wrote the uh, opening line. It was a dark and stormy light, uh, night. Um, so there was a question whether Tesla got his idea from Bulwar Lighton, and he said he didn't, but it's hard to believe that he was, was not influenced by, by that great author. Okay, next slide. So we're at the Spanish-American War. And this particular uh, political cartoon is actually discussing Tesla because Tesla's sending electricity through his body. And, uh, and so you can see that Tesla entered you know, the mainstream here in, in the late 1890s. He had already, as we saw with some of the other talks today, he had harnessed Niagara Falls and he was world famous at this time. But he said that this remote control boat would end all wars because if everybody had one of these boats, no one would, would invade uh, any other uh, country with a ship because the ships would be sunk. So this was seen as an ultimate weapon. Uh, next slide. And uh, Teddy Roosevelt uh, had gone down, you know, uh, he was a rough rider. And right after he came back, he met with Tesla. Tesla was good friends with uh, Robinson, uh, Corrine Robinson, who was Teddy Roosevelt's uh, sister. So I found a letter that uh, he writes to uh, Corrine Robinson where he says, um, 
it was very nice to meet your brother. He doesn't mention Teddy Roosevelt's name. So I had to do a bit of research to figure out who the heck his brother or her brother was. And it turned out to be uh, the governor of New York and about to become vice president and president of the United States. Okay, next slide. So this is a picture of Mark Twain and Joseph Jefferson, and that's uh, Dickinson Alley in the back. He's the photographer. And uh, Twain was in Tesla's lab uh, about 1895. And so was Joseph Jefferson. And these pictures were in the Century Magazine. Well, Tesla had invented this remote control robotic boat, which he said could end all war. It was, it was the idea of drone warfare. They, they also had aerial drones at the time. You could drop bombs. Um, and Twain was very interested in selling these uh, remote control robotic boats uh, in, while, he, while he was traveling in Europe. So I have uh, the, the entire letter that, that Twain writes from Europe uh, asking Tesla for the rights to uh, sell this to uh, the kings and queens of Europe uh, as a way to end all war. Okay, the next slide. So this idea of Tesla's link to war is how I came up with the, the title of the book. I wanted to keep the word wizard because the first book was entitled Wizard. And so it's called Tesla Wizard at War, The Genius, The Particle Beam Weapon, and the pursuit of power. And uh, the book will be published in April. So I'm looking forward, I haven't seen a galley yet, I'm, uh, but I've corrected, you know, uh, uncorrected galleys. And so I'm looking forward to this. Okay, the next slide. So this was uh, shot by me um, while we were filming the te television show, The Tesla Files. And if you look in the back, you see some people walking over the grounds. They're uh, doing ground penetrating radar. And what we discovered, uh, which is in uh, the third segment of this show, was Tesla really had tunnels. And uh, when I wrote Wizard, uh, he talked about these earth grippers that stretched out from the tunnels. And I thought they stretched out like a fan, you know, uh, like a spokes of a wheel. And uh, Gary Peterson thought that they would stretch out one after another, length by length by length. And it was 300 feet of tubing. And he made such a good argument, I, I wasn't uh, uh, sure, maybe he was right. Maybe it wasn't like spokes of a wheel. But when we got the photograph of the, uh, of the uh, actual tunnels, there were four of them, three of them are 100 feet long, they're about 50 to 60 feet below the ground. And the fourth one's 40 feet long. And right above the tunnels, you can see these spikes uh, coming out like uh, spokes of a wheel, uh, just uh, exactly as I described in Wizard. So that was exciting that I came up with the right idea. Um, and then the big question was, we, when we made the television show, where, the, where are the, um, the, the blueprints for Warden Cliff? You know, he worked with Stanford White, W.D. Crow was the builder. And we, we spent a lot of time and energy to look for the blueprints, but we were unable to find the blueprints. Uh, but no one's really discussed before, before me, really, the real reason for these tunnels. And I hypothesize in the new book that he needed, uh, you know, it, since the, the ground uh, earth grippers were uh, going out at about 50 feet below the ground, and he wanted to go down there for testing, it's tiresome to go up and down six or seven flights uh, every time he wanted to do something. So I think he was going to bring down equipment. I think they might actually- You want to go by yourselves? Excuse me? Get him as soon as possible. Are we okay? Um, so this is the next slide. And we see uh, the tower in the process of being built. And we see that he has yet to get the top of the tower. So he goes back to JP Morgan and he says, you know, I need to uh, put the uh, cupola on the top. And Morgan looks at the uh, contract and he says, wait a second, this tower is much taller than, than we described. And what Tesla had done was he had doubled the size of the tower because he found out Marconi was infringing his patents. And he wanted to, instead of just sending impulses just from uh, Long Island to, to Europe, particularly to England, so that, uh, Morgan could get the stock prices when he was in Europe. He figured that if he doubled the size of the tower, he would then be able to send impulses all around the entire world. This Zoom meeting that we are having right now, Tesla envisioned all of this at the time. It was mostly a wireless uh, uh, telephone at that time that he was trying to create. But on his own, he raised an additional $50,000 to put the cupola on top. 
Um, and uh, we figured recently $150,000. Uh, I heard the other day that this was worth about $40 million. So this was, you know, a 50, 60, 70 million dollar project uh, at the time. And Morgan, as uh, I explained in detail in Wizard, uh, was simply unwilling to give Tesla the balance of the money. In part, it was Tesla's fault. He had actually breached the contract, but Tesla was telling Morgan, look, it's, uh, it's, I'm only asking for another $100,000. And for Morgan, that wasn't really much money because he was buying paintings for that amount. So Morgan at that point blocked him. And the question is, you know, why did Morgan block him? And I think the, the reasons were, were many. One, as I said, Tesla built a, a larger tower than they agreed upon. Uh, another was Morgan may have had doubts about Tesla's abilities, but also Tesla threatened uh, the, uh, the different uh, industries that Morgan controlled. For instance, he had rubber plantations in Africa. He had copper mines out West. He had lumber yards in Alaska. And all of that was threatened. So in 1906, uh, when I noticed that Tesla's handwriting falls apart and he suffers a nervous breakdown, Morgan just shuts the door on him and everything collapses. And then there's a run on the uh, stock market again and the market collapses and, and it had to do with the mani manipulation of copper stocks. So I made the case that maybe uh, people realized that once Tesla's wireless system was dead then copper would be worth a lot of money again. And so there was a lot of manipulation on the copper stocks and uh, Teddy Roosevelt was president at the time, and he comes in and he tells uh, Morgan, you have to control the bank because the banks are collapsing. And Morgan did not help one of his friends who ran the Knickerbocker Bank. And that fellow took a gun and shot himself in the stomach and committed suicide. So one of the people that Morgan knew very well committed suicide because Morgan wouldn't give him the money. Um, and it's a big question about Tesla. Uh, to his strength, he comes back from this uh, terrible uh, uh, defeat. Uh, to continue to be create, creative for the next 40 years. Okay, next slide. Yeah, so here we see the cupola, we see the top of the tower. Uh, next slide. Now, uh, Robert Gulpe used to stop by my house all the time. He had a, I live in Rhode Island and he was in um, uh, Massachusetts. And he brought over this picture. And you can see here, uh, you see the ladder and to the left of the ladder, you'll see a step lead. And Tesla never put the central pole inside this tower. He never really harnessed the tower, except there is some proof that in 1903, he did harness it. But since he never put the pole in, uh, you know, to drive the energy up and down the, the tower, how did he do it? And Golka discovered the lead, that's it, the step lead there on the left. So I think it's a very important uh, picture. There are many pictures of the tower and this lead is in, it's not in most of them. This was from about 1902, 1903. Okay, next slide. So here we see the actual contract with uh, JP Morgan, that's Morgan's signature. And Morgan was king of the world at that time. He was the most powerful man at the world, uh, in the world. And Tess was saying, I'm going to advance the world a century. It's a very sad story uh, that Morgan would not change his mind. Once he made his decision, that was that, and Tesla was shut out. Um, and his fame really declined greatly uh, at that time. So he had been world famous, and then he really became less and less well-known as the years went on. And eventually his name just completely disappeared. Uh, when I, in 1976, barely anybody heard of him. Okay, next slide. So, we're at 1906, the, the tower collapses, uh, not, not that it physically collapses, but the deal collapses. And about 1910, 1911, 1912, the Germans come in and they start the, the German company Telefunken and they build two wireless towers around right before World War I took place. Uh, the one on the left uh, is uh, the Tuckerton plant. That's 850 feet high. It was the tallest building in the world uh, next to the Eiffel Tower, which was taller. And at the right was the Sayville plant. Uh, Joe Sikorsky is working on a, on a movie on Sayville. He did that opening uh, little uh, number uh, with me. Uh, and I have to thank Joe for that. But that's a little segment from the film that he's working on. And it's all about Sayville. So Tesla was hired by the Germans to be a um, a consultant for the Tuckertown plant in New Jersey and also for the Sable plant in uh, on Long Island. 
And he was earning about $15,000 from each of these places. That was a lot of money then. You have to multiply it by at least 10. So he was making about equivalent to about maybe $300,000 a year around 1914, 1915. Uh, and he's trying to get the money because Warden Cliff is still up and it's still physically there. So he wants to raise the money uh, to go back and, and, and relaunch Warden Cliff. And then, of course, uh, what happens is, you know, World War I in intervenes. Um, next slide. So this is part of the, partly what Tesla envisioned. Here we see an airplane being run. Uh, one of the uh, other speakers earlier talked about wireless transmission of power. And Tesla said that you could transmit uh, wireless power to airplanes and you wouldn't have to uh, use uh, fuel on the planes. And you'd have towers all over the world. If a tower you know, collapsed, you lost its power, you would have other towers which would take over. There must be backup systems as well that he would set up. Okay, uh, next slide. So here we see Tesla in 1915. Um, Fritz Lowenstein was his uh, associate. And uh, Lowenstein was out in Colorado Springs. We mentioned Coleman Zito uh, and uh, Zito's son also Tesla uh, worked with. But Lowenstein was at this time now working with John Hayes Hammond Jr. And to Tesla's uh, right is uh, Lee DeForest who Tesla was, Lee DeForest was enamored with Tesla, tried to work with Tesla many times, but uh, Tesla just didn't have room for him. And DeForest eventually moved to California and actually came back partly just to go to this uh, event. Uh, Jonathan Zenick is right in the center. He, was, he came over with uh, Ferdinand Braun at the far left. These were the two uh, uh, German uh, physicists who, uh, Tucker, uh, who uh, Telefunken wanted to come to the United States because Marconi had sued Telefunken for patent infringement. Now, Telefunken had hired Tesla. So Tesla, right at this moment, is working with Zenek and with Braun uh, at, at uh, Sayville and also at Tuckerton, mostly at Sayville. And what the Germans had done, what Telefunken had done, was they had placed their uh, wireless transmitters on U.S. Navy ships. And I found a letter, which is uh, in, uh, in a wizard, uh, written by Franklin Roosevelt, who was the Assistant Secretary of the Navy. And he said, geez, we're being sued by Marconi. What am I going to do? I got to do some research here. Let me go th uh, through the, my log here. And wow, look at this. Tesla predates Marconi. So we can use Tesla's uh, testimony against Marconi in this legal suit. So, Mar uh, so uh, the Amer uh, you know the U.S. government, the U.S. Navy, through uh, the Assistant Secretary in particular, and Joseph Daniels, who was the Secretary of the Navy, uh, were aligned with the Germans at that time because we had uh, their wireless uh, transmitters aboard our ships. Um, in the center, you see John Stone Stone. He was the president of the electrical company, uh, electrical organization at the time. And he will testify at, at this big uh, meeting in, in Brooklyn. And uh, Marconi comes in on, on the Lusitania to also to testify. Zenek testified. Braun's there to testify. Braun and, and Marconi shared the Nobel Prize in wireless in 1909. And Tesla, of course, was extremely angry about that. He wasn't mad at Braun. He was mad at the Nobel Prize Committee uh, for not honoring him. And at the very far left, you see Sarnoff. Sarnoff starts NBC. And he's also working with, uh, will be working with Marconi. So this is a very amazing photo, uh, a rare photo uh, of Tesla with, you know, his, his colleagues. Okay, next slide. So here Marconi comes in, as I said, on the Lusitania and he goes to Brooklyn and he has a very long deposition. Next slide. And Tesla is going to testify for uh, the uh, U.S. Navy, for Franklin Roosevelt, and also for uh, Telefunken. And Marconi is called back because of the war, but he doesn't go back on the Lusitania. He goes back on another ship under an assumed name, and the Lusitania is sunk. Um, so this is an amazing story. Uh, did they sink the Lusitania in part to kill Marconi because these were competing wireless companies? Um, 
or was it just a coincidence that he was on that ship? As it turned out, the Lusitania was the fastest ship on the high seas, and 1,500 people, uh, almost, I think 1,200 people died, but almost as many people died on the Lusitania as died uh, on the Titanic, which was three years earlier. John Jacob Astor was on the Titanic, and he died. And when he died, uh, now Tesla was in uh, deep trouble because he owed money uh, to uh, the world of Astoria about almost $20,000 in back rent. And I think, uh, you know, asked to look the other way, but, but uh, Bolt, who was now the manager, would not look the other way. And now Tesla was on the hook. So we transferred the property, the Wardenclyffe property, to the world of Astoria to cover his debt with, with the uh, belief that he could get it back once he paid off the debt. Okay, next slide. So if you look on the left here, right in the center, with 19 more taken as German spies. Dr. Carl George Frank is the fellow from Telefunken who hired Tesla. He was arrested, uh, Zenik was arrested, and Braun was arrested, and they were sent uh, first to Ellis Island and then uh, eventually to uh, a prison camp down in Georgia. And, uh, but, but I have here another very important article on the right. I think it's the most important article ever written uh, in, about Tesla's life. It says Germans triple the wireless plant. They tripled their power. Now, how did they triple their power? The way they tripled their power was they listened to what Tesla said. Tesla went to Sayville and he said, you guys are wasting all your energy sending it out the top of the tower. You need to drive it into the ground and send it through the ground. So they greatly increased the ground connections and then they became the most powerful wireless plant in the world. There's always a big question, could Tesla uh, achieve what he said he could achieve? Or, you know, was he um, uh, full of malarkey or was he real? And this article establishes that when he told them what to do, it worked and they tripled their power. So I think this is the most important article uh, of all the articles ever written about Tesla because it's at the moment and it is the proof that once he said, if you do X, Y, Z and Q, you will increase greatly your, your power. And they did X, Y, Z and Q and they increased their power. Okay, next slide. Now, the fellow on the left is Privy Counselor Alpert, and Tesla has a dinner with him and, and uh, Carl George Frank before Frank was um, arrested. And Alpert is secretly funding the fifth column uh, with von Papen and uh, other uh, German um, officers uh, living, uh, you know, staying in Washington, D.C., and also in New York. Tesla's friend was George Sylvester Virak, who was a poet, and he was a German propagandist. And he was meeting with Albert, the guy on the left. And Albert was giving him money to run his newspaper, where they were arguing uh, for the Americans not to get into the war. At the same time, though, there were also, there was an assassination attempt uh, on J.P. Morgan Jr. He was actually shot uh, by Munter, who was a uh, part of the, uh, the fifth column. Uh, they exploded ships, they poisoned horses, uh, they were planning on uh, uh, collapsing canals and, and blowing up bridges, doing everything they could to stop us from getting involved. And so uh, Virak goes to visit Albert and he's being tailed by two uh, Secret Service men. And uh, they both come out of uh, Albert's uh, establishment and they go in two different directions. Al Albert takes a, a train one way and, and Virak takes a train another way. And Albert falls asleep on the train. And when he gets up and leaves, he leaves his uh, suitcase there by mistake. And the Secret Service guy takes off with the suitcase. And he finds out uh, that there were all the secret codes in there, that Von Papen has a secret name. Uh, Albert is uh, uh, distributing money to all these people. This all happened before Tesla had been with him. And uh, so that's one crazy aspect of this story. I, I don't know why Tesla didn't know uh, because the newspaper eventually covered this, but Albert was not kicked out of the country until uh, 1917, when the war started. Okay, next slide. So they had, uh, you know, all of these secret um, spies, and in France was Mata Hari. Um, so uh, when Carl George Frank was taken back to Germany, he met with 
of the, the handler of, of uh, Mata Hari in Germany and then came back to America. And there's a scene in, in, in the book and, and from the newspaper articles, the test was called into Broadway to fix one of the wireless uh, station, you know, that, that Telefunken had on Broadway. And it seemed that they were sending secret messages to submarines uh, uh, at that time. Okay, next slide. So here we see von Papen on the left. He was uh, the diplomat uh, stationed in Washington. He was a, uh, a commander of the army and Captain Boyed was a commander of the Navy and they were coordinating uh, all of these uh, uh, horrible deeds, including, as I said, the attempted assassination of J.P. Morgan Jr. When von, von Papen returned to Germany, he became the chancellor of Germany. And then when Hitler took power, he became the vice chancellor under Hitler. Zenek uh, was a Nazi sympathizer. When he got back to Germany, you can see him getting an award uh, in the early 1930s. There were two uh, Jewish uh, individuals uh, that were working at, at uh, one of these organizations that Zenek was in charge of and he had to fire them. Uh, so there's a very dark story. And that's part of the, you know, when I talk about you know, wizard at war, all of that is linked. That was in, we covered the Spanish American War, and that was, that's World War I. Okay, the next slide. So now we're going to move towards World War II. Tesla had a particle beam weapon. Now, what happened in 1915, still during World War I, Tesla's tower is still up and running, and it's not going to collapse until 1917 when they actually destroy it. So he uh, admits to the world that he really has a, a, a what he calls the death ray, that, that the tower could be uh, changed into a death ray that could shoot down incoming planes. He's actually trying to talk to um, Woodrow Wilson, who's president of the United States, and maybe Wilson will save his tower. Okay, the next slide. Mr. Safer? Yes. We are coming up on, we're going to have to be moving on soon, and we're going to have to have you back for your full presentation at our next Zoom, just because of time. You are amazing, and I don't want to have to hurry you on, but we do have a lot of people. Okay. Uh, you want to give me one more minute, or? Of course. Okay. This is an amazing photo of Tesla. Okay, next slide. Uh, so we see the particle beam weapon. Next slide. So in the Tesla files, we uncovered a lot of uh, different documents. Uh, next slide. And here we are in the bottom of the Hotel New Yorker. Uh, that's Joe Kenny on the right, and Travis Taylor, and Jason Stapleton in the back. And there was a generator that could run everything. Next slide. It run the entire tower. We had a scene with uh, Bill Turbo. Uh, next slide. Um, well, I'll have to keep going. Let's keep going. Next slide. This is the actual particle beam weapon that Buharj revealed to the world. So in World War II, uh, next slide. What I found in my uh, discussions, uh, in my uh, research in the new book, is that Tesla was literally negotiating with Joseph Stalin and with this guy, Voroshilov. I have uh, documents that were uh, decommissioned from uh, Russia. Uh, so they're now revealed. And so I discussed that Tesla actually sold the details to the Russians. Next slide. Next slide. And then he was negotiating, next slide in England with, uh, this is uh, Sir Hugh Ells and uh, General McNaughton. Next slide. This is uh, McNaughton working with Winston Churchill. Tesla was, he was a head of secret weapons development for the Canadians. And I have letters between McNaughton and Tesla. Next slide. Next slide. And that's uh, Van Eva Bush. He's the head of secret weapons development for the Americans. And that's a letter to Tesla wishing him happy birthday. Next slide. Um, this is the death ray article. Next slide. Uh, keep going. Next slide. This was my joke about Van Eva Bush. This was the wrong Bush. Okay. Next slide. So this is the guy who was the head of secret weapons development. He was the head of the Manhattan Project and also the head of uh, uh, the secret weapons uh, the particle beam weapon for Tesla. Next slide. So he hires John Trump on the right. Trump is uh, Tesla's, um, uh, I mean, is uh, Donald Trump's uncle. And he 
worked at MIT. So he was a professor at MIT and so was uh, Vinnie B. Bush. Next slide. Uh, next slide. Uh, OSS, we found a link to them. Next slide. Next slide. Now this is uh, General Craigie. Uh, General Craigie uh, was um, believed in Tesla's inventions. Uh, John G. Trump did not. So he was a general, he was the first guy to fly a jet plane uh, for the military. Next slide. Uh, next slide. So I found uh, this, well, we located through Prometheus Films, uh, a document signed by Franklin Roosevelt asking to meet with Tesla shortly before he died. And Roosevelt was trying to deal with the two different uh, uh, ultimate weapons. Uh, next slide. Would it be uh, the particle beam weapon or would it be the atom bomb? And uh, what I found in this new book is that Tesla was negotiating with Franklin Roosevelt, with Joseph Stalin, with General McNaughton, with uh, Vannie Bush's Bush's people, the very highest of echelons, this is when he was this old man. Everyone thought he was this old doddering man. This is not the case at all. He was working with the very highest of echelons. Uh, next slide. Uh, next slide. Uh, keep going, next slide. So the rail gun is the modern uh, uh, prototype, which is an advancement of the particle beam weapon. And uh, I'll end on this particular slide. Um, what, what we do here is, what I've done here is established that uh, Tesla's inventions, uh, you know, laid the groundwork uh, for many inventions of the future. Let's do one more slide. Uh, we see the flipper plane becomes the Osprey, you know, and uh, next slide. A flying wing, this is the modern uh, shuttle, which is yet to be built, all based on ideas, based on Tesla. So that's a lot of what my book is about. And, uh, thank you very much. It's been an amazing conference and uh, uh, I hope you guys enjoyed it. Dr. Seifer, thank you so much. Uh, we definitely want to have you back at one of our um, individual Zooms as uh, many of our presenters have expressed interest in having individual time and we would love to do that and hear more about when your book comes out. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, our next expert is Dr. Coram. Dr. Quorum, we're so happy to have you here. Dr. Quorum is a doctorate of electrical engineering. He's published over a hundred articles and technical papers. When I went to look up how to introduce him, I realized, well, he sounds like he knows a lot more about Tesla than I may, will probably ever learn. So <laughs> glad to have you here, Dr. Quorum, to present the mystery of the increased uh, capacitance in October, November, 1899 at Colorado Springs. All right, thank you. Let's see, uh, you have a video there. I hope you got it all queued up and I'll try to be as brief as I can. Yes, uh, we, yes we've got your video coming up right now and we appreciate you and your presence here today. Uh, yep, in one second. All right, let, let me talk while well, you're doing that. Uh, our, our goal probably for about the last 40 years has been uh, to demystify Tesla's assertions and to reduce uh, uh, the explanations to conventional uh, engineering. Um, yes, go ahead with your video. It looks like you got it. And uh, the increased capacitance over his professional career, Tesla <clears throat> made many bizarre assertions, most of which have logical explanations. We want to focus today on number five: the capacity of a body increases with height. Uh, he announced it in January thirtieth, nineteen o one, in the New York Sun. Uh, the classically, the capacitance uh, versus height varies almost hyperbolically here. As you raise the ball, it approaches its isotropic capacitance. Uh, we've learned over the years that if you do what Tesla said he did, you'll see what Tesla said he saw. Well, what was going on in this exper experiment that he runs at Colorado Springs? If you back up to 1896 or so, you can see he's actually running with a, a ball that he can raise and lower uh, in his Long Island, uh, in his New York laboratory. 
Here you can see the removable roof where he says I could pull the capacity up and down. In the photographs uh, inside the laboratory, you can see a pulley just underneath the, uh, the ball above the extra coil. Uh, here you can see it in a little bit more detail. Uh, in, on May 29th of 1901, Tesla uh, sketches this uh, uh, adjustable height ball. And here you can see he's, he's actually got a piston that he's raising and lowering the ball with. And of course, this looks like a, a premonition for what's going to happen with the, uh, the Wardenclyffe Tower. Here's the experiment that Tesla was running at Colorado Springs. He's got a 60 foot wooden tower with a, a wire running down, he can raise and lower the ball. At the bottom, he's going to have a coil. Here's the actual circuit that he's using. And he's got a variable frequency oscillator at this point to excite the base of this helical resonator. And he'll raise and lower the ball and measure, uh, determine the capacitance from this. Here's the mystery. Um, capacitance doesn't go up as the ball is elevated. All right, well, how is he doing the experiment? Here's the capacitance uh, bank that he's using, uh, a regulating coil back to a uh, uh, rotary spark gap and the high voltage transformer that he's using. Um, he gives you in the diary what the procedure is and we want to focus here on this step three and you'll see that this is where there's a problem. Here's the procedure. He measures the inductance of the re a resonator at 138 hertz, which is the power line frequency going into Colorado Springs. He sets the height for the ball. He then adjusts his VFO down here uh, until the structure is at resonance. Then knowing the tank capacitance and the regulating coil inductance, he can calculate the frequency that he's operating at. From that frequency, he can then determine what the ball capacitance is at that height. But here's the problem. He uses the inductance that he measures at 138 hertz, and he uses the RF frequency that he's operating at, and the problem is this. The inductance at 138 hertz is not the same as the inductance at the uh, resonator frequency that he's operating at. Here you can see, this is a summary of Tesla's own data. Here you can see uh, the VFO frequencies that he has. And that's what he's going to use in this uh, formula for uh, capacitance. But he's going to use this value of inductance that he measured down at uh, 138 hertz. And when he does, he determines that the capacitance of the ball is increasing as he raises the ball. And of course, that can't be true. And of course, when you look at uh, Neumann's uh, self-inductance formula, you find out hey, wait a minute, uh, you can't factor this, this current out to cancel with the current in the base to get a simple geometrical form, formula for inductance in general. It only works in special cases. All right, the cardinal sin is that the Tesla coil is not a lumped inductor. And we've gone over this before. Uh, and you can actually plot the Tesla coil on a Smith chart. The Tesla coil that loaded with the ball is a transmission line, a velocity inhibited transmission line, and has spatial resonances not lumped element resonances, and where every, uh, these are the zeros of the impedance, um, actually the reactants, are the series resonant frequencies for this system. And the current distribution is different at the different frequencies. For example, uh, here we have a resonance at 175 kilohertz. Here's the resonant at uh, 400 and, uh, like 435 kilohertz and then 600. And the current distribution is changing on the structure. This is the voltage distribution. It's changing as well along the structure. All right, here's the helical coil. Uh, and we're going to use the transmission line model for it. Tesla's uh, actual physical dimensions. We calculate the properties of the helix. And then we'll use the actual values for the capacitance of a, a, a ball at these heights above Earth from uh, classical electro electromagnetics and at uh, eight feet high we'll, we'll, we get uh, a frequency resonant frequency 329 tesla measured 331 the difference is uh, is un well under one percent 10 feet 33 feet 57 feet um, we we know what the capacitance of the ball is we calculate the frequencies and then compare them with the frequencies that tesla measured and we're on the order of five percent or less this this one uh, at 10 feet, yes, yeah, a tad over. Uh, so 
here are the, uh, the values that we calculate, the actual values for the capacitance um, of these values, uh, the capacitance of Tesla's uh, uh, structure. So <clears throat> we think we've got the mystery resolved and what it boils down to is the fact that we've got a distributed element circuit, just as Tesla described in his Belgian patent in 1897. So Tesla knew better. Um, <clears throat> the question is, why? Why did he do this C of H experiment? What, why was it so important to Tesla that he would spend almost a third of his time at Colorado Springs chasing this ball up and down the wire? Tesla said the ball could be pushed up and down and lifted to a certain height as I needed it. Why did he need it? Well, we found that if you do what Tesla said he did, you'll see what Tesla said he saw uh, every time. Some experimenters have gone after me have found a difficulty. They say, no, we can't replicate it. Well, it's not my fault. I never had the slightest difficulty. Anyone who has no more than my skill can do it. Thank you. All right, well, uh, our goal uh, for the past 40 years has been to demystify uh, Tesla's assertions and reduce them to conventional engineering. Um, this actually goes back to uh, uh, Dr. Marencic. When we met him at the, uh, he was the, I guess the technical director of the museum there in Belgrade. And he's the one that had edited uh, the Colorado Springs uh, uh, diary back in, what was it, 1979, I guess, when it appeared in English, 78 or 79. And what we found every time is if you do what he said he did, you will see what he said he saw, whether it's ball lightning or signals from extraterrestrial uh, origin or uh, even, uh, there's just so many things, but I've got time to talk about them. Uh, Dr. Seifer, uh, your talk was wonderful. Uh, we enjoyed it. I would have gladly given you my time to, to hear some more, uh, but I think that's enough. I've used up my seven minutes plus Thank you so much. Can I ask you a question? Yes. Um, is one of the reasons that he raised and lowered the ball so that he could increase and decrease the lengths of the, uh, of the frequencies so he could pinpoint energy to different points on the earth? <clears throat> well, let's see. Uh, I, think, I think the simple answer is no. <laughs> he was doing something else with it and I really don't want to get started down that, that road today. Okay. All right, thank you. Again, this goes for all of our participants today. Um, today is our overview and getting everyone involved. And, you know, you all deserve you know, your own time and recognition. And we promise we'll be having you know, the one blessing of coming into this format is we can get together more often. So be encouraged that we would love to hear from you all more and we'll um, definitely be reaching out. Um, next up, I have Gary Peterson of 21st Century Books. Gary Peterson is another one of our experts on Tesla. I feel like every time, and I'm so happy to finally really see you there, Gary, because every time I talk to Nicola Lonchar, I hear Gary Peterson said, Gary Peterson said. So today we're gonna hear what Gary Peterson says about Tesla, and thank you so much for being here. Yeah, we just need you to unmute there. Okay, here we go. Thank you for uh, inviting me to present at this at this conference. And uh, uh, I realize there are some time constraints here, so let's just jump right into it. And so I do have a PowerPoint here that I will share. And uh, give me a moment. So, the uh, first step. Okay. Uh, 
Gary, you have your website ready if you want me to go to that for a moment. It's up to you. Well, uh, you know, um, it's just taken me a few moments to get to the to the right spot here, and and okay. we'll be ready to go. Uh, okay. So. Please pardon my uh, my poor uh, operation of PowerPoint here and Zoom conferencing. So, but you're, we'll you're, doing, you're doing great. <laughs> we'll when, get when, yeah, we, we need, and, and thank again everyone. Thank you for our patience with all of our participants and with um, with your uh, hosts here as we had difficulties. I want to reiterate to everyone: we do have this recording. And so this will be out on um, YouTube and on our website after the conference. So don't worry, we will still have um, our publicity from this for everyone. Yes, okay, well, I'm getting closer here now. All right, <laughs> all right, here we go. And screen share. So, uh, think so do we have anything now yep is it uh you see it okay yeah, well okay. we're halfway there so now I was interested to hear Mark's description in his presentation about the uh, uh, underground structure associated with the Wardenclyffe Tower. And before I get into my presentation, I would like to uh, just uh, share this slide that uh, uh, I prepared for another presentation that I've, I've just put up here. And You'll notice that uh, there is a, uh, 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 Mark spoke of uh, four radial spokes, uh, and this is a side view of the, of the tower, the underground structure associated with the tower. And there's also some circuitry up here. Oh, uh, well, it looks like that was, uh, uh, it must have had a timer set on it. So. The, uh, this is a side view, a cross-sectional view, and these are two of the four radial underground uh, tunnels that were actually brick-lined tunnels that, uh, according to George Sheriff, uh, Tesla's number one uh, uh, assistant back at the New York City laboratories, these uh, tunnels actually rose to the surface and there was a little igloo-shaped uh, cap on it. And this same on the other side here, curves up to the surface. And then, and then there were a similar two others going in and out of the image here. Um, and the purpose of these was, uh, uh, according to the sheriff, was uh, for drainage, to, to dry out the, uh, the uh, terrain uh, directly below the tower and adjacent to the tower. These, one of these actually uh, apparently came up inside of the building. Uh, uh, and uh, so the overall distance may have been close to 300 feet as these extended outwards uh, in a radial fashion. Now, additionally, there is this, uh, 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 this is according to Lee Anderson and uh, his book, Nikola Tesla and his work with alternating current and their application to wireless telegraphy, telephony and transmission of power, that's a mouthful. Um, uh, there was uh, Tesla in the uh, foreclosure proceedings described uh, having uh, uh, iron pipes, steel pipes, pushing them one after another, uh, some 300 feet, 16 of these pipes appro approximately according to his recollection. And it, I believe that, uh, uh, and, and others, uh, uh, for instance, Robert Uth, uh, we believe that the, uh, these pipes were actually vertical 
in orientation and went straight down below the tower and uh, uh, served as a ground terminal electrode for the oscillator. Uh, so that uh, I wanted to share that. And uh, uh, so getting into, into the presentation, uh, now uh, a, a couple of years ago, I put together a quick book called uh, Pursuing Tesla Vision, Tesla's Vision, Creation of a Tesla Curriculum. And uh, in that piece, I suggested that uh, uh, the largely word by word, uh, word of mouth uh, recounting of Tesla's engineering legacy within uh, the mass media uh, resembled the game, uh, uh, the children's game, Pass It Along, where uh, some kids line up and the first one whispers in the ear to his, uh, his neighbor, uh, a message and got down on the line until the last player actually announces the received message to the group. Now, according to Wikipedia, uh, this is described as uh, in the, the error that there, there are errors that typically accumulate in the retellings. So the statement announced by the last player differs significantly and often amusingly from the one uttered by the first. Now, as a result of this, uh, uh, this the possibility that this is actually going on in, in the real world on in media, uh, in the recounting of Tesla's legacy, uh, uh, some facts about Tesla have been obscure, obscured and errors have been introduced uh, into the picture that has been drawn of this pioneering inventor's work. So, uh, the fact is that this distortion uh, is not limited to public perception. Uh, in fact, the mainstream uh, science and engineering communities are also subject to the same effect um, and at, at causing this thing that at times it's difficult to distinguish between truth and that which is only hearsay, uh, having no scientific basis in fact. And uh, this is presently the case when evaluating the legitimacy of Tesla's world wireless system design. Now, getting to the slide, uh, this shows Tesla demonstrating wireless transmission by electromagnetic induction uh, at an 1891 meeting of the American Institute of Electrical Engineers at Columbia College, New York City. Um, uh, Understanding that his high potential, high frequency induction coil transmitter had no ground connection. And now understand this, that it had no ground connection, only two foil covered capacitor plates. And those, you can see these here, uh, these are charged up to high potential uh, uh, radio frequency current. And these uh, Gessler tubes, uh, these gas filled tubes were illuminated. Uh, by that. Now, as time went on over the next few years, uh, the, uh, his uh, transmitter evolved where he actually did include a ground terminal connection uh, uh, associated with a single layer coil winding uh, and a solenoid type of coil winding with a single high voltage air terminal capacitor. Now, this is from uh, uh, high frequency oscillators for electrotherapeutic and other purposes, uh, 1898. So here's a, a just a basic drawing, a rendering of the Tesla wireless system. We see the, uh, the transmitter and the receiver uh, and uh, air terminals and ground terminal electrodes uh, uh, down at the bottom, towards the bottom here. And uh, these, and uh, so, uh, the way Tesla described this is that it is now quite certain that at any point within a certain radius, the source S, a properly adjusted self-induction and capacity device can be set in action by resonance. And so uh, the basic the idea that you have a transmitter and it serves as a source of, of radio frequency current uh, and with proper adjustment of the receiver, that energy is transferred from the transmitter to the receiver. Fairly simple concept. Uh, 
the um, now here's an example, of sort of a large scale example of what we were just looking at there. Um, that uh, Tesla set up in Colorado Springs this is the Colorado Springs Experimental Station, uh, and the on the left uh, is a uh, this structure on the left uh, constitutes a. Uh, uh, a world wireless Tesla world wireless system transmitter, uh, and then in the foreground over on the right here, uh, this is uh, a a, uh, a receiving coil that uh, a grounded uh, wave meter receiver uh, that was used for testing purposes, and um, the uh, coil was. Uh, 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 about two feet, a little over two feet in diameter and 71 and a half inches tall. Uh, so it was, uh, and it was round with number 10 wire, uh, 274 turns. And the separation between the transmitter and the receiver um, was 1,938 feet. And uh, which is just a little bit over a quarter wavelength. I believe the uh, transmitter operated around 120 kilohertz. So Tesla said to make the, and Mark spoke about uh, his significant photographs. And to me, this photograph on the right of the, of, the, of the wave meter, I believe this is the most significant photograph in my mind of documenting Tesla's work. Um, and, uh, a comment that he made in a in an article in English Mechanic and World Science in 1907, he said to make the little filament glow the entire surface of the planet, 200 million square miles must be strongly electrified. The little lamp will spring into the same brilliancy anywhere on the globe, there being no appreciable diminution of the effect with the increase of distance from the transmitter. Now this is a that's a pretty wild claim. Uh, and uh, but as Dr. Corum says that uh, 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 if you basically just reproduce what Tesla was doing, you'll see what he saw. Now this this particular demonstration is non-trivial uh, matter of reproduction um, in terms of reproduction, but it is possible and uh, to build this. It's just a matter of engineering. So. Uh, uh, I personally look forward to the time when uh, results along these lines are reported. So the next slide here, uh, let's see what we have. Okay. Now, this is uh, the subject of, of my presentation and it has to do with the actual propagation mode involved with Tesla's transmitter. Um, you know, it's not radio waves, and it's been said that it's a uh, it's a surface wave, actually. Uh, and this concept of, of of a surface wave is related to electrical conduction through the Earth, uh, uh, electrodynamics, uh, electrodynamic current through the Earth, and uh, to get an understanding of, of that type of current, um, a fellow by the name of Arnold Sommerfeld uh, did some work in 1927 uh, describing the behavior of electrons in a conductor uh, that resulted in what is known as the free electron model. And um, in this case, the valence electrons associated with the atoms in the metal of free electrons are soon to be detached from the ions and forming an electron gas. And uh, Dr. Corum has written, uh, uh, because of its low resistance, the global spherical transmission line may be modeled as an electric gas. The global spherical transmission line is the Earth. Uh, so uh, uh, that quote, uh, is uh, from Dr. Quorum's uh, et al. Uh, paper, uh, 1896 or 1996 paper, Spherical Transmission Lines and Global Propagation, an analysis of Tesla's experimental determined propagation model of the appendix, plasmons, longitudinal waves, 
in the world as an electron gas. Now, um, getting a little more specific, uh, uh, when you when an oscillating electric field is applied to the terrestrial transmission line, this is ca this causes uh, Earth's free electrons to accelerate uh, uh, in plasma, harmonic plasma oscillations. So these these electrons are actually oscillating within the Earth, and um, this is an induced oscillation. This can this induced oscillation can result in longitudinal charge density waves along the Earth atmosphere interface. The Earth being a lossy conductor and the atmosphere being a dielectric. Now that once again, uh, this can result in longitudinal charge density waves along the Earth atmosphere interface. So um, let's uh, move on to the next slide here. And so the, um, there were a number of individuals, uh, uh, four in particular that I'm, I'm pointing out here, um, starting off with Dr. Tesla, of course, um, who built and operated uh, a structure, Colorado Springs, a structure capable of launching a terrestrial surface wave. And this was in 1899. And this was eight years before uh, this, this surface wave was mathematically described by Jonathan Zenick. Um, also uh, in 1899, a gentleman uh, by the name of Arnold Sommerfeld that I mentioned earlier, whom I mentioned earlier, suggested a non-radiating radiating electrodynamic wave that is guided along a wire of finite conductivity. Uh, and this is just uh, uh, the electromagnetic field associated with a, a wire that's carrying electric current. And, um, and then in uh, some years later, in, in 1907, Jonathan Zenick uh, expanded upon this description, uh, uh, depicting a unique surface wave solution, Maxwell's equations of a hypothetical infinitesimal dipole antenna in a planar interface between two homogeneous media. Uh, now this was non-specific to the Earth itself. It's just a generalized uh, uh, um, uh, analysis. Uh, the uh, uh, working now working within the context of a Zenic solution in 1909, Sommerfeld developed a formal analytical solution for the radiation field from an electrically short vertical monopole radio antenna positioned on the interface between a finitely conducting ground and the atmosphere. And, uh, and, and in this case, he identified both space waves and surface waves. So um, that was uh, uh, the significant, significant findings. These were significant findings that got us to where we're at right now. And then and, and, um, there was another gentleman by the name of George Gubau. He was uh, apparently in, early on was a student of Zenix and then uh, worked under Zenick in Germany um, uh, in the 1930s. And uh, then uh, uh, as uh, time went on, uh, uh, Zenick actually became part of Operation Paperclip. And uh, this is Werner von Braun uh, after the, after, not Zenick, pardon me, Kubau. Now Zenick, he was different types, like I know nothing, you know. Uh, the uh, but Kubau actually came came to the United States and uh, published a paper in uh, 1951, a treatise titled "On the Zenic Surface Wave," and in this uh, in this piece he wrote, "Orthogonality relations exist between surface wave and space wave." So this is a mathematical relationship between the two actually linking space waves and surface waves together analytically. And he analytically demonstrated that Zenic wave is physically realizable uh, uh, as he reported in that treatise. So um, that uh, 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 is, uh, uh, those are some of the, the key players that have inspired uh, 
us to uh, uh, to uh, continue our work. And uh, well, I'm uh, uh, I'm just a little I'm just a bug in all of this. The the real uh, significant work is uh, is being carried out largely by Dr. Coram and his, and his brother Kenneth and their associates. So um, now. Uh, there was a, a time uh, back uh, around the turn of the last century, 1901, uh, that uh, radio was really being demonstrated as a, a real thing. And Marconi uh, sent an international Morse code letter S across the Atlantic. And this sparked a debate as to the true nature of over the horizon radio wave propagation. And uh, one opinion uh, was that it was associated this sort of propagation with an uh, ionospheric guiding effect, which actually turns out to be the case uh, in the case of radio space waves. Uh, a competing viewpoint about radio transmission and reception was the idea of a wave propagating along Earth's surface, like the passage of electric waves along a conductor as uh, uh, Sommerfeld had uh, 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 thought about back in the uh, 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 just just prior to this time, and now Tesla accepted both of these ideas. In reality, uh, uh, writing from my circuit, you can get ninety percent of electromagnetic space waves if you like, or you can reverse the process uh, by proper design and choice of wavelengths. You can get five percent in these electromagnetic space waves or electromagnetic waves, in his words, uh, and 95% in the current that goes through the earth. Now this idea, that's, that's what I'm doing, this idea of 95% in the current that goes through the earth. That's, that is what I am doing. This is Tesla in 18 or 1916, he says this. I tell the man who applies my invention, you must not make the antenna give off 90% in radio or electromagnetic space waves and 10% in current waves because the electromagnetic waves are lost by the time you get a few arcs around the planet. He had uh, discounted or neglected the, the ionospheric effect while current travels to the uttermost distance of the globe and can be required, uh, can be recovered. Uh, uh, and this view, by the way, is now confirmed. Note, for instance, the mathematical treatise of Sommerfeld, who shows that my theory is correct, that I was right in my explanations of the phenomena. So Tesla was paying attention to what Sommerfeld was talking about and felt that Sommerfeld was, in fact, validating uh, the design of his system or the principles of operation behind it. Uh, at the time, uh, Tesla and Sommerfeld believed that the radiating Hertz wave and the non-radiating ground current wave were mutually dependent upon each other for their existence. And this is uh, demonstrated by this, uh, this, uh, this slide, this illustration uh, showing uh, Tesla's uh, circuit that he spoke of. Uh, uh, basically, this is the uh, Tesla oscillator. Uh, connected with a ground terminal connection to earth and an aerial structure. Uh, and uh, with the proper design, it could be, um, uh, it could be, uh, it could be designed to preferably produce uh, uh, the radio waves to optimize to produce uh, electromagnetic Hertz waves in his words or, or radio waves or uh, with a slightly different design, uh, it could be uh, um, designed to, or it could be uh, optimized for the for the production of surface waves, radio surface waves. Uh, the uh, uh, in Tesla's words, uh, the caption of this is this: the circuit energizing the antenna. Uh, this circuit, this is the circuit energizing the antenna, and uh, pardon me. This is the circuit energizing the antenna. As vibratory energy flows, two things happen. There is an electromagnetic energy, electromagnetic energy radiated and a current passes into the earth. First goes out in the form of waves which have 
definite properties. These waves propagate with the velocity of light uh, while this electromagnetic energy, electromagnetic energy, the current, uh, a current passes into the globe. So now there is a vast difference between these two, the electromagnetic and current energies. That energy which goes out in the form of waves is, as I've indicated here, unrecoverable, hopelessly lost. You can operate a little instrument catching a billionth part of it, except this, all of the, uh, all goes out into space never to return. This other energy, however, of the current in the globe is stored and completely recoverable. Now, uh, I heard the name uh, mentioned, uh, Dr. Marincic, uh, and in, uh, in 1990, he performed a short analysis, published a short analysis of the Tesla wireless system. And in that analysis, uh, Alexander Marincic, former director of the Nikola Tesla Museum in Belgrade, wrote, Tesla's waves, if we are allowed to use such a name, are in fact surface waves in modern terminology. So um, I think that about says it all in terms of, of what we're talking about here. But even with all the work that was done by Tesla, there was really a, a, a not really a firm answer of what was going on. Was this radio waves uh, radiating through the air or did what Marconi had developed and what uh, subsequent electrical engineers, RF engineers had, had refined, was this using radio uh, space waves or was it something else? Was it in fact, as uh, Tesla had, uh, had asserted that it was uh, uh, using uh, something else? And uh, between 1919 and 1935, a controversy arose regarding the physical reality, even the reality of the radio surface wave propagation mode that, that had been asserted by Tesla and uh, Sommerfeld and Senek. Uh, uh, and this was uh, the, uh, the, the questioning, uh, the controversy was due primarily to analyses performed by a gentleman by the name of Herman Weil and also Kenneth uh, Norton of Norton uh, ground wave fame, uh, who obtained solutions that can also be interpreted, interpreted as the superposition of a space wave and a ground wave uh, without the term explicitly identifying, uh, identified with Zenic surface wave. So uh, this created a, uh, a, a seeming discrepancy that uh, resulted in exp an experiment being performed uh, on radio propagation uh, in the two matter, a two meter uh, amateur radio band, um, that was uh, uh, it was a propagation of two meter, two meter radio space waves conducted over Seneca Lake uh, in upstate New York, and this was conducted by C. R. Burroughs of Bell Laboratories. Now Seneca Lake is one of the Finger Lakes, uh, James Fenimore Cooper fame, uh, uh, Cook, uh Pathfinder, all those guys. Um, it's a very deep lake. It's the result of uh, glaciation uh, and uh, this deepness uh, made it ideal for, for, perform for performing this type of, of a study um, uh, that it created a uniform uh, surface over which to, uh, uh, to uh, uh, conduct the experiments. So uh, in the case of if you were to try to do it on, on the ground, uh, you would find variations in the the uh, 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 permittivity, the permeability, the uh, uh, the conductivity of the surface uh, that would interfere with the collection of data. So doing it over a deep lake was uh, an ideal way to proceed in this. And um, as the uh, the end result was that uh, uh, the uh, this Norton surface wave was observed, but uh, Burroughs concluded that the Zenic wave, 
as modeled by Sommerfeld was not excited. Uh, and this is a, a piece of the surface wave in radio propagation over plain earth. Uh, this was dated 1937. Now, uh, this, uh, I, I guess the, uh, the actual work was performed in 1936, uh, or, or I'm, I'm a little uncertain, it might have been 1935, but it was in that time period. Um, now, this, uh, this actually shows the, uh, the data that they collected and the predicted uh, 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 curves associated with the, uh, well, first of all, curve number one is just a radio wave in free, free space, uh, the lossless case. Uh, and it falls off geometrically proportional to one over the distance, uh, inversely as the distance. Um, and then, uh, uh, and, and this is a logarithmic uh, plot here, this, this uh, scale on this. Uh, uh, curve two shows the predicted variation in the received signal strength, field strength, for the same radio wave excited by a vertical dipole radiating in free space propagating over a lossy conductor ground conducting ground plane to a Seneca Lake. Uh, the solid circles represent Norton ground wave measurements made with two boats and the open circles represent measurements made with one boat. Uh, and then uh, uh, so uh, let me, I, I want to go back to the, the previous slide here, just to clarify a point uh, that the, uh, okay, where are we, where are we? Hi, Gary, we may okay. have to have you back I'm, I'm for an one. Okay, great. I just have courtesy for our Serbian friends, since it's later there, we want to okay. make sure we include everyone. Okay, I'm, almost, I'm very close to the end here. Uh, okay, amazing. You're doing great. Thank you. The way Tesla, uh, the way uh, uh, Burroughs did this was he had two boats, a motorboat and a just, I guess it was, it was a rowboat. And he had a transmitter in the rowboat and he had a receiver in the motorboat. And you drag this thing around up and down Seneca Lake, changing the distance between the two, uh, the two, uh, 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 with this, this rope he could change increase the distance between the two and thereby collect the uh the data that he was uh, looking for uh now the curve th number three is to predict the zenic wave or surface wave over the same in the, under the same conditions uh and uh this this shows a, a, a different uh attenuation characteristic of the of the zenic surface wave so this these are the two paths in, uh, in one case, he had a uh, transmitter on shore and a receiver on the other side of the lake uh, and was varying the height. And then this path here is the, where he was uh, driving up and down the lake. So now this, this here, I have to thank Dr. Coram and, uh, and Jim, I mean, Jim and, and Ken uh, uh, for, their, for their seminal work in, in uh, figuring out exactly what Tesla was doing uh, in Colorado Springs and um, and attempted later at, uh, at Wardenclyffe. Uh, and they, what they did was, and this was in 2014, they replicated the Burroughs experiment. And in addition to using the uh, simple vertical dipole antenna of Burroughs, they also used their patented polyphase waveguide probe design uh, which is the first realistic stru launching structure capable of exciting the guided electromagnetic uh, Zenic surface wave, uh, which can predictably mode match with the terrestrial transmission line medium. Now, at, at this point, I have to mention that, of course, Tesla did this, uh, uh, this same thing in reality, but it was uh, more of a matter of trial and error for him. It wasn't a matter of... Uh, of real uh, rock solid uh, math and engineering that uh, that resulted in Tesla's success in Colorado Springs. Uh, now uh, the quorum's measurements in the six meter amateur radio band using this structure have resulted in the experimental verification and NIST traceable documentation of Tesla's 
1897 to 1899 surface wave propagation phenomenon. Now, in furtherance of the scientific method, I encourage uh, uh, educators and their students, along with research, to repeat this momentous work for the benefit of all mankind. So, uh, just uh, finally, this is the last slide. Uh, uh, the Zenic surface wave is supported by a planar interface between two homogeneous media with different dielectric constants. Its electric field strength falls off exponentially at a rate of e to the minus alpha d over the square root of d with uh, 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 a in the direction of inter uh, propagation along the interface where alpha is the attenuation constant and d is the radial distance and the field intensity of the bound mode wave is at a maximum at the interface between the two regions and it decays exponentially in a vertical direction above and below the interface so um i'll leave you with this and uh uh, thank you very much for your attention. Harry Peterson, it's our honor to have you here today. Thank you so much. Well, it's my pleasure. Thank you for inviting me. Great. Uh, thank you, everyone, for your understanding with our time constraints. And um, I certainly have to stop your screen to, share. I could listen to people go on forever, Gary. Yes, if you could stop your screen share. Um, so I wrote in the chat, there are some people who had submitted just videos without presentations because we do have people here live waiting for the next part. We're gonna put those videos at the end and we'll record them with the Zoom for the YouTube when it's out. Um, and we're going to turn it over now to Lana Asanen, who is the host of Tesla Talk TV. Lana is a wonderful speaker and actress and she is going to lead us through the rest of our ceremony. Thank you, Lana. Okay, hello. <laughs> hello, everyone. Let me see. How do I get my screen bigger? I'm so sorry. I'm still new to this. Okay. Gotcha. So if you um, go up to where you can see a little like um, waffle in the top right corner, you can move it to speaker view and then you'll see you. Oh, yeah, that. <laughs> All right. Well, hello, everyone. How is everyone doing today? Great. I hope good. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I mean, we're doing this a little bit different uh, than what we usually uh, are known for, but uh, I hope you see, I hope you like my little background. Um, I think it's a mirror image, so it's probably a twist that I'm still new to that whole Zoom uh, technology, you know, <laughs> although I'm a professional when it comes to hosting, but this is all new to me. I don't do too many Zoom meetings, so I apologize for that. But um, however, it is a great pleasure being part um, of the 2021 Tesla Spirit Award virtual conference. And as a Serbian, it is truly an honor and privileged to be the master of ceremonies for this conference and the host of Talk Tesla Talk TV. Um, I don't know if you, did you see me, Sam? I did. <laughs> I have to read, you know, so, um, however, uh, before we, you know, start um, with our ceremony, I would like to, you know, send out my condolences to Nicola Launcher, who cannot be part um, of the ceremony today and, um, I feel very, very sorry for what happened to his nephew. So, um, you know, prayers to him and his family, and it's a sad day. <laughs> so, however, let's continue. Um, let me see, we have, let's continue with the first uh, speaker of the Tesla Spirit Award Ceremony. So how am I gonna do? I'm gonna call the name, I'm gonna, give a little bit info about or bio about each person. Um, I do apologize, I don't have everybody's uh, biography and it was kind of last minute and because due to the pandemic, um, you know, a lot of people have other jobs. They were not able to come back, um, to get back with me, I'm sorry. And uh, so therefore I don't have everybody's biography. So I apologize if I don't. So I might just call the name and then we move on to the ceremony. If that's okay, Ashley. Okay, 
Yeah. All right. So thank you. Uh, so our first, um, okay. Our first uh, award goes to uh, speaker Alice Oswald. And Alice Oswald is the author of the new book, Tesla's Words, a stunning utopia of the future. He works with the Tesla Science Foundation as a writer to provide educational materials to schools and universities for the Tesla clubs. He currently resides in New York City, where I'm from. <laughs> so yeah. So uh, that would am, be I to, am I supposed to say something or? I Sorry. Yes, I know you already gave your, <laughs> Alice did already give his talk, but yes, if you want to just say a couple words, Alice, you can, and we just wanted to honor you tonight. Okay, no, just thank you guys so much. Um, I, I, I don't want to say anything. I just, I just felt like, <laughs> it felt natural to chime in and say, hey, thanks. Thank you guys. <laughs> Alice, congratulations. Thanks for participating in the Tesla Science Foundation. We very much appreciate all your all your interest in uh, and uh, innovation. Thanks so much. Okay. So I get. Can we move on? Yeah. Back to you, Lana. <laughs> okay. Well, th thank you so much, Alice Oswald, and to my fellow New Yorker. <laughs> um, we move on to the next and um, the next test. Let's award goes to Andrea. Vukovic uh, or Vukovic <laughs> and um, let me read a little bit about okay so ah, per, sorry <laughs> one moment I'm trying to get here okay all right so Andrea which Andrea Vukovic graduated from the Faculty of Fine Arts in Belgrade, Serbia with a master's degree. He's an independent artist, sculptor with over 20 years of experience in visual art, as well as 18 years of experience in the VFX industry as a digital artist, creating digital models and creatures, creatures for films and commercials. Andrea was twice nominated for the prestige VFX award. <laughs> Exactly. Wait, I was trying to read, and I guess <laughs> we have X Award. And um, Annie, outside of his work as a senior facial modeler, he creates portraits, figures, and fantasy creatures in traditional clay. He has exhibited multiple times in group exhibitions, and his artwork is in private collections around the world. So please welcome Andrea. Hello? Is Andrea here? Is Andrea here? Well, that, that was his artwork. So that was a photo of him and his artwork. Mm -hmm. Yes, unfortunately, I don't see Andrea on there. So we will um, make sure he knows to watch the video for his award. Go ahead, oh. Alana, back to you. Oh, okay, so he's not, oh, all right. So, um, okay, so now we go back to, uh, hold on. One moment, just trying to pull up the information. Okay. Our next uh, award goes to Dr. Francis Listingi. I hope I pronounced that right. And um, I do not have his biography, but I was able to pull up some, you know, information on Facebook. <laughs> so I did a little research and um, I hope um, I'm reading this right, but um, yes. So Dr. Francis Lestingi, he's the co-director and co-founder at uh, Buffalo Niagara Nikola Tesla Council. He is um, dedicated to promul promulgating the legacy of a genius physicist and pro prolific inventor Nikola Tesla, the man who electrified our civilization and it started right right here, I was going to say. It started in Buffalo, New York. So please welcome Dr. Francis Lestingi. Thank you. Is Dr. Francis here? He is. Can you come off mute, doctor? Thanks. Yeah, yeah I'm here. Thank you very much. I'm here. <laughs> <laughs> we know that Dr. Lestingi, he went through his project before. We wanted to honor you, doctor, and um, hope that you will keep up with your great work to promote Nikola Tesla. Good. 
good. Well, thank you very much. That's that is our objective. Okay. You very Thank much. you, Doctor. Thank you, Doctor, for all your participation. It was a pleasure helping you out. Thank you. Thank you, Doctor. It's a pleasure meeting you as well via Zoom. And uh, you did an amazing job earlier. So thank you so much for being part of it. Thank you. It, it was my honor and pleasure. All right. So uh, we go on. So moving on to the next, we have a uh, stain or uh, I'm trying to pronounce it properly because I know people. Um, might uh, get upset. So I believe maybe it's Stane Ribic in Serbian. <laughs> so that's the proper way to say it, Stane Ribic. Stane Ribic, again, I do not have um, any information of him, but all I know, he uh, works for the Tesla bus radio in Prague in uh, Slovakia. Um, so he's part of that. So please welcome Stane Ribic. Tana here. And we, we have a beautiful video to show at the end for him as well. So when, yeah. when we, we'll show that. Okay. Great. So yeah, because he's not here to speak for himself. Let's move on, Lana. Thanks. And sorry for, I guess, some people maybe were not able to come, but we do still want to honor them. And thank you, Lana. Oh, of course. Absolutely. You know, like that's um, what I'm here for. <laughs> All right. So we move on um, to our next. Uh, Tesla Spirit Award, and that goes to Vesna and Jarko Jeric. So it's a little bit, a uh, little bio of Vesna Darko. Vesna Jeric was born and raised in Bosnia and Herzegovina. The award project was made by her father and herself. Her father Jarko is a civil engineer, while she's a graphic engineer and third designer, three de designer. She mostly deals with 3D modeling, vis visualization, and animation. After this project, she became a member of Tesla Science Foundation. She also designed three products that are related to Tesla. Alarm system bottles for alcoholic and non-alcoholic beverages, and she's working on other projects related to Tesla for the Tesla Science Foundation. So please welcome Vesta and Jarko Jeric. Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you, Lana, for introducing uh, me. I'm so glad to be here with you guys today. Uh, it's a great honor to be a part of this organization and I'm so thankful for this uh, Tesla Spirits Award. Um, I prepared a short video presentation about this project. Uh, this project was done by me and my father and you will see it. So Craig, you can play the video. Thanks. Yeah, I, I, I've got uh, two PowerPoints in the video. We'll play them at the end. Is that cool? Okay, yes, sure. All right. Thank, thank you. you. Congratulations, thank you. Thank you. Okay. We're playing the video now or later? Are we playing the video? The, the, the plan would be you're gonna do all the announcements and then I'll play all the videos in a group. Okay, thank you, Greg. Thank you. Um, our next um, Tesla Spirit Award goes to Tatiana Basova. And here's a little background of Tatiana. Tatiana Basova is a contemporary artist who lives and works in Russia, Vladimir. Her vibrant paintings pay homage to various historical figures and philosophical doctrines. Oh, what happened now? Oh, okay. <laughs> Um, doctors, um, figures and doctors. Basova has a specialist degree in Japanese studies. She has mainly explored Bushido, which is a moral code concerning samurai attitudes, behavior, and lifestyle. Basova's samurai artwork has been shown in exhibitions in Moscow, including samurai art of war. However, she has touched upon many other themes in, the, in her art, including martial arts masters, Vikings, mythology, spirituality, spirituality and Nikola Tesla. She believes that art mean, must contain powerful and strength-given ideas that would move the heart and energize the mind. And this is what she hopes to achieve. So please all welcome Vesna, Tatiana Pasova. Is she here? <laughs> I think unfortunately due to time, we may have lost some of our friends here. So congratulations to Tatiana. Back mm -hmm. to you. Okay. So, 
All right, so we move on. Uh, next speaker would be, okay. So our next Tesla Spirit Award goes to someone very special, and her name is Mirjana Rajcevic. Mirjana Rajcevic Tasic was born in Belgrade, Serbia. She lived in Moscow and studied at the Moscow State University, Lamonosov. She has a degree in TV journalism and works as a TV correspondent for Moscow. After returning to Serbia, she continued working for RTS Broadcasting. She also lived in the USA, mainly in Chicago, and worked for various newspapers. Mirjana, an author of many articles published in Serbian newspapers, such as Duga, Interview, Geopolitica, Politica, and RTV, Teoria e Praxa. <laughs> Uh, by the way, I know all these newspapers and um, broadcasts. Uh, at this time, she is an editor of Media Network Serbian Diaspora and author of TV shows Our Meetings and editor of TME magazine Serbia Online in the RTS World Department, RTS World. So I hope Mirjana is here with us tonight. Is she here with us? Sorry, Lana, I don't see her. <laughs> Lana, I'm going to look at the rest of the list here, too. See okay. People. It's it's wonderful to celebrate people, whether they're here or not, uh, based on their dedication to Tesla and the Tesla Science Foundation. So we're so very much appreciative of everyone that's been part of our organization and, and all their contributions. So in their absence, we still give them a, a firm uh, round of applause. Thank you, Lana. Yes, thank you. Um, thank you so much. So we have... Um, Let's move on. We have two or three more to go and uh, then we can go on with um, Ashley and Bray. So um, the next uh, Tesla Spirit Award goes to Freddie Fernandez. Uh, again, I don't have anything on Freddie, but I was able to pull up some Facebook info on him. So Freddie Fernandez uh, is a lead motion graphic designer at Promorific Motion Graphics and also a Tesla ambassador in Australia. Um, and uh, in, so currently I think in, he lives in Oregon based freelance motion graphic artist. He served clients from all around the world. My, uh, his graphic design approach and years of experience working in TV and radio provides him effortless skills in commercial designs, promos and logo creations. Um, I'm not sure from his uh, profile if he lives in Oregon, Australia, so maybe he lives in both countries. <laughs> However, let's uh, all welcome Freddie if he is uh, with us today. Okay, Lana, I'm getting sad now. I'm getting sad. <laughs> I think Freddie is from Australia, lives in Australia now. Okay. We, we do continue to honor him. Thanks, Lana. Back to you. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you, um, Lana. Thank you, Greg. Um, our next uh, Tesla Spirit Award goes to James um, Z. Louis, Liu, Louis. <laughs> I don't know if I'm pronouncing this properly, but he has a PhD in Tesla biohealing. I don't have any uh, biography on him, so I hope if he's with us, he can uh, um, speak a little bit. And yeah. I'll speak for him. He's the doctor who invented our products. He's a wonderful, wonderful guy. He'll be very happy to hear that. Thank you so much. I hope I, I, so I, hope I pronounced his name uh, right. I don't know. I Dr. Liu, yeah. yeah. James yeah. Liu, yes. He's a wonderful, yeah. brilliant guy and very dedicated to Tesla. So thank you again all for having us here today. Thank you so much for your dedication. What a wonderful thing. Thank you. Thank Thanks. you. And um, our last uh, Tesla Spirit Award goes to Angelo Grubisic, which I also don't have any info of him. If he's around, uh, is he with us today? Well, what we're going to be doing is showing a video uh, for, uh, for Angelo. It's, 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 a, it's a posthumous award. Uh, he's, he's in heaven. So we're going to be showing that last. Okay. Well, I mean, um, I think that was it, you know, like I thank you so much for having me. I mean, as a Serbian, it's truly an honor to be part uh, of this uh, amazing, interesting and um, event. And, uh, you know, Tesla is um, 
it's, you know, like I, I've never met Tesla, obviously, but uh, I was able to like, I hosted the past three years and we hosted it at the New Yorker hotel. And uh, I had this one opportunity to actually um, stay in his apartment or, you know, where he actually lived. He lived in the New Yorker hotel uh, before he passed away. So um, that was quite interesting. I remember being in that room and I remember looking at Tesla and he was looking at me and I thought he was talking to me. <laughs> it was, uh, yeah, it was interesting, uh, bizarre too. But um, I do want to say before I, um, uh, before I move on, there's uh, just one thing. Okay, there's a beautiful quote that I want to recite from Tesla. And it kind of reminds me a little bit because I'm a deep thinker. So I really love this quote. And if you don't mind, I'm just going to read it before I leave. Um, it's uh, the scientists of today think deeply instead of clearly. One must be sane to think clearly, but one can think deeply and be quite insane. So that is one of my favorite quotes. And um, again, because I'm a deep thinker, so I kind of relate with that. And um, so I want to thank everyone. It was a pleasure meeting everyone over Zoom. Um, I hope you all stay safe. And hopefully in the near future, we can continue and see each other in person. And um, that's it. So thank you so much. And uh, I'm going to say goodbye from New York. And thank you. And I hope we see you in person at the New Yorker next year. Absolutely. Yeah, it would be so nice to see, you know, like I, I miss uh, being with uh, people. <laughs> yeah. Great. Thank you so much, Lana. We appreciate you as always. Great presenter. Okay. Much appreciation. I, uh, and I want to say, I also want to thank, you know, Milica Savage, who is watching right now from Serbia. I want to thank her so much for the contribution and for all her hard work that she's been doing. And um, also, again, Nicola Launcher and his family, my condolences. And, um, and uh, yeah, stay safe. And uh, I will see you next year. Thank you. Thank you, Lana. Thank, thank you. you, Lana, for your participation. We appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Craig, can you cue up uh, Ms. Desna's video, please? Yeah, so uh, uh, coming from the Philadelphia branch of the uh, Tesla Science Foundation, I want to thank everybody for staying on. What we're going to be doing now is showing some video programming that was attached to the awards recipient. So just stay on. We'll play them through. And uh, when we're done, you'll have an official goodbye from our host here. And uh, once again, thanks so much for coming on today. Stay tuned. I'll be with you in a moment. wonderful video program. Once again, please stay tuned. We've got several more to show. It's very exciting, the kind of things that have been created. Here comes the next. This is going to be a PowerPoint. Okay. Here it comes.
that was fan that was fantastic. I'm going to play the next PowerPoint. Thanks so much for participating and, and keeping your attention. Here they come. was wonderful. We still have, uh, if I'm not incorrect, one or two more to review. And, and I'm so thankful that you guys and gals are, are, are staying with us. So we'll watch, um, let me look back at my list. Who, who didn't we watch? Uh, we watched number five, right? Did we not watch uh, Mr. Um, Ribich? Did we watch his? We did not, right? No. no? Okay. So we will do that next. Thank you very much. Here comes the next one.
These are all highly educational. Thanks so much for all of your artistry, everybody. What wonderful things you've created. Amazing. What a learning experience. First of all, we would like to wish you a happy and a healthy new year 2021. We are speaking to you from Trnava, a small town located in the west of Slovakia, also called the Little Rome because of the large amount of churches. There are 14 churches and one of them is the Orthodox Church. It was built in the 18th century by Serbian traders who inhabited this area. Today, unfortunately, this church is in a desolate state and we sincerely hope that in 2021 we will start renovating this sacral building. My grandfather Stanerybic is the president of the Association of Serbs in Slovakia since 28. And so far, he has done a lot to propagate Serbians who live in Slovakia. I would like to underline two important moments. In 2010, he managed Serbs to receive the status of a national minority in Slovakia. In 2015, the Serbian language was inscribed in the European Charter for Minority Languages used in Slovakia at his initiative. He has organized over a hundred cultural educational and sports events, the exhibitions of paintings, photographs, chamber sculptures, festivals, book publishing, football tournaments, it is not easy to count them. I would like to mention some of them. Every year he organized Serbian documentary film festivals and this year it will be the 10th anniversary of this festival. Films are produced by Serbian producers, which are trying to show the view of Serbian culture, traditions and mindset. Due to my grandfather, over 30 book titles have been published till now. Poesy, novels, historical and special books. My grandfather secured the revitalization of the Serbian war cemetery from the First World War in Velki Medjer, where are over 6,000 Serbian martyrs buried. Today in Modra are situated two monuments of Serbian notabilities, Jovan Jovanovic Zmaj and Dosite Obradovic, thanks to my grandfather. My grandfather loves Tesla's work and everything related to him. In his office is hanging a large and a beautiful picture of Tesla made by Branko Redenkovic in 2010. In this year, Stane organized a picture exhibition, Nikola Tesla, Inspiration of the Future, where were shown pictures from 38 authors from the whole Europe. The exhibition was in several towns of Slovakia and in Bratislava, were also exposed the functional models of Tesla's invitations made by Branivir Jovanovic. For my grandfather is the biggest satisfaction in relation to Tesla that he erected a monument to Nikola Tesla in the building of radio and television of the Slovak Republic in Bratislava on January 22, 2020. The ceremony was attended by representatives of Serbs from Hungary, Austria, England, Slovakia, Slovenia, ministers, ambassadors, representatives of the diplomatic corps and many celebrities from Serbia and Slovakia. And what are the plans for the new year 2021? The plan is to publish a book, Notes of the City Council of Novi Sad. 
This city granted Tesla the status of honorary citizen of Novi Sad during his life is the only one city in the world. It happened on the 10th of July 1936 on the day of his birthday. According to Staneri Beach is making initiative to build a statue of Nikola Tesla in Novi Sad. In addition, he plans to place a panel behind the bust of Nikola Tesla in Bratislava which will show some of Tesla's inventions as well as his life. We sincerely hope that the Tesla Foundation will also take a part in this action. My name is Simon Bucalo and I am proud of my grandfather. Želim da vam se zahvalim na ovom za mene veoma dragom priznanju. Zahvaljujem se vama, Teslinoj naučnoj fondaciji, Nikoli Lončaru, predlagaču Marko Lopušini. Zahvaljujem se i Fondu za podršku kulture nacionalnih manjina Slovačke republike i svima onima koji na bilo koji način propagiraju rad i delo ovog našeg naučnika, pronalazača i Srbina Nikole Tesle. Okay, wow, and that was, that was just so fantastic. What an educational experience we're having uh, being part of this large organization, learning from every single one of you, all, all of your uh, patterns of communication, all your thoughts, all of your research, all of your relationships. It's, it's just amazing. Uh, I want to truly thank you for uh, exposing all of us to this. Um, one or two things more, and then I think we're completed. Um, this will be a dedication. And then once this is done, I've got something to say and I'll be handing that over to Ashley. Here's, here's one of our last videos coming from YouTube. Here we go. Yeah, I'm uh, Dr. Angelo Grubzic and I'm a, I'm a lecturer of astronautics when I'm not doing this, uh, when I'm base jumping or flying jet suits. We're going to try to get a couple of words with Angelo. In fact, we're going to come in and get a couple of words with the man himself, Angelo. Wow. I mean, that is all we can really say. That was incredible. That's uh, pioneering human flight right there. 1,050 horsepower, harnessed uh, using everything that we're given at birth. You make it sound so simple. Last question, because I know lots of people want to meet you as well. When you're hovering out there so still, how much are you having to put into it? How much is your body having to work? It's probably a very ridiculous question. It's kind of like riding a bicycle. You know, a lot of people say, how do, you, how do you steer it? How do you ride a bicycle? It becomes the ultimate amalgamation of mind and, and machine. When, when you're part of the machine, you know, it's, uh, you are part of that control system and you just think, you think, I want to go over there and you figure it out. Good off, Angelo, thank you so much. That was incredible from you guys and the Gravity team. Thank you. Awesome, thank you very much. So I've been here for the last um, uh, so five, five, six days now, and uh, we brought a team together from all across the world, Australia uh, and uh, Italy, and we're, we're opening some amazing lines here. So this area has not been jumped at all in the past. You've got to be really uh, top of your game, and uh, it's been super fun, you know. Um, we've learned a lot. Uh, we're getting really tight as a team, doing a combination of base jumps like we did, did this morning uh, on some super tight lines and then uh, flybys from a Black Hawk helicopter, which uh, I'm told is one of the most advanced Black Hawk helicopters there is. So it's been uh, really uh, a privilege to be here.
Yeah, the boys, that was that. Uh, beautiful flight. You. Oh my awesome. god. Saudi Arabia. <laughs> Okay, and we want to thank you for uh, taking a moment and viewing that with us as well. Hold on a moment. Um, Ashley, you'd like to go to who next? Who do we, who do we decide? So we have, hmm. you said you wanted me to. Can we do, I think the only other ones we have right is, uh... Yes, can we go to um, Violetta's and then do Debbie Price's, please? And those will be the last two, right? Just give me a moment, okay, everybody? I need to cross-reference some numbers, please pardon me. Uh, Violetta is in, is in where, which category? I'm sorry. She was... Um, right after number four in keynote speakers. I think you put her number five. Uh, Violet, okay. Give me a few seconds. I'm almost ready for you. Yeah, we'll do that for you in about, about 10 seconds, everybody. Okay. It's coming right up, okay? Here we go. Here we go. My name is Vila Alexaric and I am one of senior admins of the Tesla's Ambassadors Group. On behalf of Tesla's Ambassadors, I would like to thank the Tesla Science Foundation for inviting us to this virtual conference and for giving us the opportunity to present on our group. Because Nikola Tesla was decades ahead of his time and work for the future, it is natural that as time goes by, we will hear more frequently about him and his discoveries. Please enjoy this short video presentation about Tesla's ambassadors.
Mike. Once again, you thank you so shut the door. Thank you very much once again for paying attention and allowing us to show that last video program. Do we have anything left there, Ashley? Have we have we exhausted all of our wonderful programs? So Craig, we have one more, but what I'd like to do is for us to go ahead and wrap up the night and then play that last one for everyone as we go out. Um, it's a video that was submitted to us from the Tesla Science Center in Wardenclyffe, so we do want to play it. Um, but I want to remind everyone that we did dedicate this conference in honor of Milan Lanchar, who lost his life tragically this week, um, Nicola Lanchar's nephew, and please keep Nicola in your prayers and his family. I want to thank uh, Melissa and Craig for um, coming together to support Nicola, who uh, normally did some of the organizing that we did over the past few days, and you all were a great team. I want to thank all the conference participants. Really, really proud to have you all here, that you'd be willing to spend your day with us. Um, this is just such an amazing group. We will be sending out links so that you can have all the video footage after. And certainly you all should have emails for us if you want to communicate and hope you will stay in touch. Um, Craig, I know you have a few words you want to say. Yeah, I just wanted to complete the conference today by, uh, by mentioning my, my deep appreciation to uh, the, 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 the two, uh, I guess we'll call them uh, our, my Tesla work wives, right? And I'm so happy and appreciative uh, in order, an alphabetical order to Ashley uh, Redfern, who you see here happily on camera and, and, I, and, uh, and uh, all her time and energy to create the systems in place to make this thing work. Uh, the Tesla Science Foundation uh, would, uh, like a pillar, would not be standing without you. And um, it's appropriate at, a, at an extremely high level for me to take a moment and just thank, uh, and, I, and I actually took her name and did it phonetically, right? Uh, Melitza Savage, right? So I wanna thank you, Melitza, for all the effort, for all the social media programming. Thank you, Craig, thank you. For all the website creation, for all the animations, for all the video programming. Uh, there must have, <laughs> there's a list, I probably missed a, a no. third of them there, so. I do want to do publicly thank you as well. We, you know, we don't get thanked enough. Um, just, just as a brief, just as a brief introduction. My name is Craig DeVideo. I'm, I'm a proud member of the Tesla Science Foundation, and I wouldn't be here if it wasn't for the kind people that currently participate, like all of you. Um, our journey, and this is the only thing I really want to do, is our journey um, uh, for the Tesla Science Foundation uh, is to help to tell. Um, uh, the, the, the short story of our journey as an organization telling the story of Tesla through mass media. Uh, now we're fully integrated with Zoom and, uh, and YouTube and all the platforms, thanks to for the expertise of these nice young ladies who participated um, to present virtual learning experiences through live streaming. Uh, we're on the cusp of adoption of new and innovative technologies um, in this time of adversity. And we can't wait to get together with all of you again, face to face. Um, it's real important you guys and gals know that all of our organizations need to the support. So if it's not a monetary support, but it's a time support or an animation or a graphical element or a videography support, we really need to help each other because obviously um, it's, hard, it's hard to come uh, into money to help support our organization. So um, we need to thank you and ask you to, to if you're just looking to support uh, all these other organizations, uh, you could find any one of us will appreciate your time and effort. And with that said, I'm, I'm completed in my last moment. Uh, Ashley, I'll turn it back over to you. And, um, and uh, I'll play that last video program if I could find it. I gotta figure out which one we're talking about, okay? It's from Debbie Price. And it would have been number four keynote speaker next to Mark Alessi. That's me speaking Craig and I's uh, language there. But uh, I just wanna reiterate what I put in the chat. All of your work will be featured on our website and social media. We will be using some of the speeches in the video for Tesla clubs. And of course you're invited um, to reach out if you wanna talk directly to Tesla clubs, if you wanna do future videos, presentations, we would love to have you present at future conferences as well as individual presentations. Um, if you were excited about somebody else you presented and you wanna present in a smaller group that you think is uh, appropriate for your content, we would love to have you. Um, especially thankful for some of our guests that, um, you know, have really worked hard to um, promote the life and legacy of Nikola Tesla. It's an honor to have you all here. Um, and on behalf of Nick, really thank you for your participation and your dedication.
for, I know I'm on mute there. So uh, Debbie Price was in which category again? I'm really sorry, I'm trying to make sure I, I might not have the video, right? Or was it a hyperlink? It was it's a hyperlink. Her video she sent to download, um, it's Mark Alessi number four under the keynote. Give me a moment. In case that somebody of the participants has some kind of video uh, or okay. Okay. if you want to promote any of your um, projects, Mark just send the... So send a Mark a lesson, right. I've got it. Yeah, I've got so it. in case that some, okay. It's gonna take a moment. Go ahead, Belisa. No, I just wanted to say if somebody has a need to uh, to send us some kind of video presentation or something, we can upload in our YouTube channel and to share share all of our social media. You are par part of all of us. So basically, we're there to support you and to promote you. Amen to that. Here we go. I'm going to try to play this now. Thank you so much. I found it. And uh, thank you again. Enjoy. Hello everyone. My name is Mark Alessi and I'm Executive Director at Tesla Science Center at Watercliffe. I'd like to start by thanking Nick Lanchar and the Tesla Science Foundation for hosting this annual conference dedicated to honoring Nikola Tesla's life and work. I'm excited to be here to help honor Tesla and share details about the progress at Watercliffe, Tesla's last remaining laboratory. Transforming his lab into a museum and global science center has been a remarkable journey that involves people from around the world, including many of you here today. I'm honored to share the story of that journey and our plans for the future. First, we'll pay tribute to Tesla with a video by award-winning filmmaker Joseph Sikorsky that highlights Tesla's legacy of innovation and his impact on humanity. Then I want to share a video that outlines the journey to save Wardenclyffe and plans for the site. We'll give you an inside look at the new visitor center being built this year in a video that's yet to be released to the public. And you'll learn how this is just the beginning of things to come as we reveal new details on the next phase of Tesla's lab rehab. Now, I'd like to introduce you to Joe Sikorsky's video entitled Tesla, the ultimate white hat innovator. It was a spirit of rogue, experimental rebellion, disruptive of established existing systems with the goal of replacing them with something better. He locked out conventional thinking and he was a provocative force to presumption. When people think of hacking, there's a sort of nervous admiration for the genius with that special kind of talent. And Nikola Tesla certainly incited feelings of nervous admiration from those around him, particularly his peers. He was a kind of alternative scientific artist, like a physics punk rocker. He had a different point of view. To start, Tesla saw himself not as an inventor, but as a discoverer, one that reveals solutions already in the framework of existence, to harness the real work of nature, uncovering natural secrets rather than construction built on its limitations. Such an improvisational spirit of exploration led to the concepts of radar, radio, x-rays, robotics, remote control, and even early computer tech. In fact, his teleautomaton patent, in which a prototype was demonstrated at Madison Square Garden in 1898, utilized patents for radio, wireless remote control, and a type of early logic circuit known as the Nano A and D gate, which is sort of the key to binary code. Outside the garden, it was horse and buggy technology. Inside, there was a remote controlled boat under intelligent control. Onlookers thought it was a trick that Tesla had a trained monkey inside it. That's how unimaginable the concept was. But of all his innovations, it was his induction motor, an engine that could efficiently run on alternate current electricity that revolutionized the status quo, propelling the world into an age of progress. Without it, most likely electric power would have been a rare luxury, only accessible to the wealthy. This motor, born of Tesla's fertile and untarnished imagination, was previously considered an impossibility by the scientific community, one not achievable through the laws of physics. Tesla hacked through perceived limitations of science and nature to move the world forward. 
He was a rogue scientist whose unconventional application of physical principles created a sense of unease in the world around him. He was a genius with an amazing talent that you'd hope would be used for benevolence and not maliciousness. One whose brilliance could reward the world with free wireless energy or punish it with a death ray or earthquake machine. Fortunately for the world, Tesla wore a white hat. And in a way, one could describe his mission at Wardenclyffe as the ultimate hack, a way to disrupt the entire global system of energy and information to help the world evolve, to point out the flaws of an antiquated system and spark a movement of positive change, to battle the titans of power and usurp their control to place it in the hands of the people. At Wardenclyffe, he had promised J.P. Morgan a radio tower, but his covert plans were much more ambitious. Free wireless power to any place on the globe. With a 187-foot high tower, he would set energy not through the air as his contemporaries were attempting, but through the Earth itself. Such a radical endeavor was far more expensive than Morgan's radio tower. According to legend, after Tesla revealed the true potential of the Wardenclyffe power station, J.P. Morgan questioned how one would be able to meter free electricity just prior to defunding the project. Sadly, this would ultimately lead to the end of Tesla's dream at Wardenclyffe. Whether or not he could have achieved the practical transmission of wireless power is an open debate. One I would personally urge caution with after studying his life for so long. For how many times did Tesla achieve his goal, despite the prevailing scientific consensus? For many, Tesla remains a true inspiration, an intellectual rebel, a scientific agitator, a fighter who violated the most respected preconceived notions of what was deemed possible, a slap in the face to a narrow-minded scientific consensus. Tesla's spontaneous spirit of discovery, in my view, made him the coolest radical thinker on the planet, launching an insurrection movement against the accepted scientific norms. He was a visionary so far ahead of his time, a genius loner, in a white hat. Thank you, Joe Sikorsky, for that amazing presentation on Nikola Tesla's genius. I think everybody will agree that Joe Sikorsky himself represents the best of Nikola Tesla in terms of his inventiveness and his humanitarian spirit. Now, let's take a look at the history of the saving of Wardenclyffe and what we have in store for the future. In 1987, when the successor in interest, you know, first it was Peerless and then Bear Corp and then Agda, when they decided to close this part of their operation down and move all their operations to New Jersey, this site went into a decades long cleanup. And a very um, diligent, local group uh, came together from the community, uh, science teachers and enthusiasts who realized the historical significance of this place. And they organized the rest of us in the community. So uh, here on this slide, you can see a number of elected officials and community members. This place matters, um, you know, putting our, our, our stake in the ground. So at the time I was an elected official in the community and you know, working with other colleagues in government and members of the community and the current board of Tesla Science Center, who was at this for over 20 years trying to save this property, um, I was able to secure some uh, state grant funding uh, that would help purchase the property, but they needed a match. And um, how that came in was the, the crowdfunding campaign. So uh, our board president, Jane Alcorn, uh, was reaching out to Matt Inman from oatmeal.com, a super blogger uh, and, and cartoonist who had a huge tech geek following and had done a cartoon in the past uh, about how Tesla's the greatest geek that ever lived. And, you know, what happened when Jane and, and uh, Matt Inman came together and said, let's launch this crowdfund, is they were able to catch lightning in a bottle. Uh, we, you know, many people continue to study this crowdfund, uh, which was one of the most successful crowdfunds and held the world record on the uh, grassroots involvement all the way up until last year with the 20 Million Trees campaign. And as an aside, 
if if anything Tesla was going to you know lose a world record, I'm sure he would have appreciated losing to such a great cause as the 20 million trees campaign. Uh, Tesla was truly one of the uh, a very strong environmentalist and wanted to see us using uh, the Earth's forces to to power uh, the 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 needs of mankind. So, with this crowdfund, it raised. $1.4 million in six weeks from 108 countries from 33,000 donors. And in all 50 states of the United States, in addition to those 108 countries, participated. So it was really widespread. Uh, I believe this organization and this location is a world historic site. And whether this crowdfund happened or not, uh, this is a global uh, center. <laughs> Where we're at now, we just got on the National Historic of uh, Registry uh, a little over a year ago, uh, and that enabled us to, uh, one, make sure this place stays preserved long into the future, and to open up uh, the location for some federal tax credits. Uh, but it was a historic moment again, uh, where our state parks uh, system was overrun with letters supporting our application. Um, I think we broke all records there. I think over 10,000 letters were sent in three days for people asking for this to be registered as a historic site. And the project has uh, pulled together um, a very strong and interesting list of both benefactors and advisors and collaborators. Um, so we're, we're, we're pretty lucky to have the kind of support that we're beginning to garner for this uh, project. It's a $20 million project, um, and we raised just over half of that already. So uh, we raised about uh, $10.2 million. Uh, we have enough money on hand to get started, and we'll be able to open our first building uh, within the next year to the public with our first exhibit. So uh, we hired, um, a architectural firm and engineering firm filed for our first permits to actually start construction, pulled some early permits and actually began some construction on site just a few months ago. Uh, it was paused because of COVID-19, but we're back at work. Uh, but our goal is to get the full site plan approved because that's when we really can start uh, the, the large scale demolition of the buildings around the lab and can start on the lab in earnest. And as we're piecing together that permit process, it should be done uh, towards the end of this year. So this is the first building that we're going to be opening. Uh, the goal was by the end of this year, COVID-19 put a little dent about uh, two to three months in that process, but we're still striving to open this as quickly as possible. And definitely by the end of the winter of uh, 2020, 2021, uh, we'll have our first building open. Uh, this is a rendering of the lab building. And uh, currently there's a lot of different offices and, and um, rooms cut up into this building right now. So we want to restore it to this rendering right here, which is the way it was um, in, in, in Tesla's time. This is what Tesla was working with. And we're planning on restoring it to that, that, um, that time period. And this is an example of what the full comprehensive science center could look like if we were to build larger buildings on site in addition to uh, the lab building. You know, education is a main focal point for this center. It's one of the main reasons that the board originally organized themselves to create uh, a, a organization at Tesla's lab. And uh, we're trying to lead the way with cutting edge education and, and virtual education in the STEM space. Thank you for watching that overview of our journey to preserve and renovate Wardenclyffe into a museum and science center as innovative as Tesla himself. Now, I'd like to give you an inside look at the new visitor center being built at Wardenclyffe in 2021. We collaborated with key stakeholders, committee members, and some of the world's most creative and innovative exhibit designers, including the people at Tessellate, who created the video you're about to see. Let's take a look at what you'll be able to experience later this year at our visitor center. Hi, I'm Emily Conrad, co-founder and president of Tesla Studio, an exhibit design company based in New York City. And we were brought on along with X Plus, our fabrication partner, to work with the Tesla Science Center at Wardenclyffe to imagine a new science center experience. 
one that focuses on Nikola Tesla's past, present, and future. And the exhibits in both form and content highlight the ingenuity and altruism of the iconoclastic inventor. And we knew for this to be unique, we needed to have a unique process that would involve working closely with the Tesla Science Center, expert scientists, educators, staff, and volunteers. This new visitor center is a balance of historical accuracy and future discovery. It is a science center reinterpreted and redefined for the audience of today and tomorrow. So now let's walk into the Bauerhaus, home of the new visitor center. As you walk in, you are vibrantly welcome to Wardenclyffe and learn about Tesla's work in Shoreham, Long Island. The site is important as the home of Tesla's only remaining laboratory and the tower that would transmit wireless electricity across the globe. Artifacts such as bolts and plates from the tower provide historical authenticity of Tesla's time at Wardenclyffe. And now you may notice a life-size depiction of Nikola Tesla. We want to establish that his ideas are at the center of the story and to create a human connection to the person and his vision of a better world. Uh, next to the introduction is a projection, an animated mural that depicts the grand vision of Tesla's 187-foot wireless transmission tower at Wardenclyffe which was to be the first of many nodes to transmit wirelessly across the globe. And now as we enter the main exhibit space, it's a 500 square foot space, we see an overview of the exhibits with the classroom behind the sliding glass doors in the back that's behind the Tesla coil in the center. And now turning to the right, there's a gesture-based interactive timeline. This allows us to delve deeper into the story of Tesla's life, who he was, where he came from, and the world events that shaped his ideas. With an eye to the future, the future portal there on the right allows visitors to imagine and contribute their answers to what the future might hold. Tesla's world is also made up of mobile exhibits that can travel outside the center to schools and other museums to share Tesla's ideologies and achievements. These programs focus on an immersive Tesla lab experience showing what the lab might have looked like at peak productivity with the other exhibit focusing on STEAM, particularly the creative aspects of the sciences, humanitarianism and conservation. So the goal of this exhibit is to spark the question, what's next for the next generation of scientists? And now we turn to the wall of inventions where we find stories of Tesla's visions made real. This is a combination of Tesla's inventions, projections and interactivity that gives us a peek inside the over 300 patents and the vibrancy of Tesla's ideas. So this includes patent drawings, mechanisms, and how these inventions have evolved into the technology that we use daily. And we hope that you leave knowing that all of Tesla's work connected to his vision, not a fame and fortune, but for a better world for all. And thank you very much. And that is the preview of the Visitor Center. And this is just the beginning of what's to come next. Thank you. I hope you enjoyed that glimpse of the Visitor Center and the exhibits and programs you'll be able to experience there. But I want to emphasize that the Visitor Center is just the beginning. In 2021, we welcome your involvement as we embark on the next phase of our journey to transform Tesla's only remaining laboratory into a world-class museum and science center. This year, we're going to begin demolition of the auxiliary buildings around the property to free up the lab building and to ensure its structural integrity. Demolition comes first externally. Then we'll be able to enter the lab building and do some internal demolition of the walls and compartmentalization that occurred after Tesla was in this lab. We want to restore the lab to its historic state. And then obviously the restoration project. So we are still raising capital to finish the lab. We're confident that this year we'll be able to raise that capital and finish the lab by the end of 2022 and open the lab to the public with exhibits and programming. Now talking about programming, All right, everybody, we very much appreciate you participating in this convention. 
Uh, what a wonderful opportunity. We say it's a conference and convention and virtual experience. Uh, that video you're watching is uh, still some more content that will be posted eventually to our YouTube channel as well. So we just wanted to make sure all of you knew that you had a chance to review that material. We, we wanted to complete our thought. Um, I wanna thank you personally from the Philadelphia division of the Tesla Science Foundation. And I'm gonna hand over and let Ashley take us out. Once again, thank you everybody for participating. Love seeing you again in person soon. Thank you, Christine, Dr. Lestigi, Craig, Bob Swain, Gary Peterson, Harry Hong, Melissa, Patrick Ryan, say thanks to Stan for us. Alice, thank you. Frederick, thank you. Yelena, um, Nikola Tesla in. I don't know who you are, but thank you. You switched off on me there. Mona Davina, thank you. Um, Stephen, I'm not sure who you are, but I'm glad you joined us today. Welcome. Um, Ms. Joan, thank you for being here. And Sasha, thank you so much. Everyone have a safe night, stay safe. And Melissa and Craig stay on just one moment so we make sure we get the recording. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Good night. I'm staying on. Okay, and everyone else, we love you, but you can hop off now so we can get our recording set. <laughs> yeah, we need, we need to actually shut down. <laughs> nice to see all of your faces. Thank you so much again, guys. Thank you. Craig, can, I, can we end it and still look at the Zoom account or we need to stay on, right? No, once we end it, as soon as we end the meeting, uh, and I guess it's going to happen on your side because I, I went to record. So I'm going to stop the recording right now. Okay. Ready? And here we go. Stop recording. Do you want to stop the cloud recording?